Watertrip. Blizzard all the way. Snow 20 feet deep. But we had to get that serum through. It was mush, mush, mush all night. Come on, mush, 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 mush. Suddenly, the glacier cracks. There's a roar. Tons of ice. No escape. Ah! How things been with you? So today we are talking about the heroic age of exploration, more specifically of the polar kind. A little bit out of sync with winter, uh, but we know Jesus was a big reader of Scott and the boys. Uh, I don't know, you may have recently seen the trend for posting physique. So today we thought we would separate the men from the boys and show you some serious masculine prowess. So without further ado, I'm going to invite my guest on, the lovely history bro. Hello, hello. Hi, how are you doing? I'm very well, how are you? Yeah, perfectly fine, thanks. Ooh, Looking you're... forward to talking about uh, Antarctic exploration. Me too. You're a little bit loud. Is that just for oh, me? Right. I'm oh, sorry right. if that sounds... Maybe I'm shouting a bit. I should just stop shouting. Sound that enthusiastic. Does that sound terribly... <laughs> sounds terribly rude of me to say that, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, I can hear my own echo back there. All right, much better. So how do we kick off then? Why don't you start us off? We're talking about the heroic age of the polar explorers. Yeah, well, when we were talking just another time about what we could talk about in the future, um, it just seemed like quite a, a cool topic for the, the Brits, the story of Scott and Shackleton and really the, the British story in Antarctica. Um, and it's, it's exactly as you said, that whole age, this like grand heroic age, as historians want to call it, um, the late ages, they call it, what do they call it, like the developed or the mechanised age of Antarctic exploration. But these mm -hmm. early pioneers... Um, they call it the heroic age. Maybe it's a bit over the top, but some of the stuff they did is crazy. I mean, it's reasonably heroic. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a bad it's, heroic it's, sometimes. It's, it's not too far off, is it? Yeah, yeah. I don't know why I'm uh, belittling it straight off the bat. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, don't downplay it. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. So the story of that, because there's not that many uh, nations that are. Um, sort of into the Antarctic, even today. Um, like, in fact, today there's the, uh, what's it called, the, the British Antarctic Survey. And there's a, a big thing called the, the Haley Station, like this big mm -hmm. modular station. It's all, it's all British, um, it's like a British thing. Um, and, you know, there's not any other nations that are doing that. And even going back to the beginning, there's only really a handful of countries that are sort of interested in um, America, Britain, Norway. Um, and But there's been a few expeditions were sent down there like the Belgians sent one the uh, the Japanese sent one at one point this is all in sort of the early very early 20th century uh, but I thought what we could do there's four main expeditions the British did I thought we could talk about those mm -hmm. and um, just before we do I'll give sort of a brief overview of the the early history of Antarctica um, but the the of the four the the big most famous ones are um, Captain Scott's sort of famed doomed expedition and uh, Ernie Shackleton's slightly later expedition which uh, is just as incredible and fantastic in completely different ways isn't it and uh, I've been reading up on the, the journals of Scott and you've been reading up on South the, uh, the, right. uh, the, the story written by Shackleton um, and between us perhaps we can cover it all what do you think? Yeah, that wasn't actually planned, was it? I'm, I'm very. I was pleased to hear this morning you've been reading a bit more about Scott because that's. Uh, I've been so absorbed with Shackleton, so I think we've got a good, good dynamic there. And of course, there's so much really to cover because uh, somebody in the comments earlier wrote about the or mentioned the Franklin expedition. There are so many of these wonderful expeditions, um, but these two, I think, are. are absorbing enough on their own. So, obviously, Scott, we're slightly earlier than. Well, the two know, knew each other, didn't they? Why didn't we start there? They yeah, were already, I mean, not, I don't know if you're comrades or um, workmates, if you like. Yeah, their Colleagues. lives are, uh, were heavily entwined. Um, the first expedition, sort of serious expedition that the um, the, the Admiralty um, sent down there um, was the ship, the Discovery. Um, and this is sort of really early. This is like they dreamed it up in 1899. It went down there in 1901. Um, and yeah, so Scott's the captain of that, and Shackleton's part of his crew, uh, one of the sort of more senior members of his crew. Um, but I think, but just before we sort of get into those early ones, I just want to say a little bit about Antarctica in general, because um, I think that might be sort of worth saying. Yeah, go um, for it. It's just that it's surprising. I think it's surprising. Most people think it's surprising when when you hear that it was only really discovered in inverted commas in eighteen twenty. 
that seems crazy, right? That seems weird. Um, yeah. It's one of those things like when you hear about Edwin Hubble in the 20s or 30s was the first to realise that there were other galaxies. Think, oh, really? only, only, then. Only, only discovered then, you say? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, what, what, the Antarctic? Yeah, yeah so it's that's one of those what we things, hate, like, isn't it? Like, like, like Hubble, you think, wow, that's so recently ago, isn't it? Um, but so the story goes, There's there, there are some <laughs> like strange stories um, of maps. There's a famous thing called the Piri Reis map, for example, mm -hmm. which is from medieval times. Um, it's definitely from medieval times. And at the bottom there, there's um, a, a coastline which seems to map onto Antarctica quite well. And uh, it's supposed to have been copied from a yet more ancient map. And anyway, the, the Piri Reis map, people argue over that <laughs> all the time. And But there's other examples of, um, you know, pre-modern maps which show something down there. But basically the formal story of history, <laughs> somebody like Graham Hancock would argue against, but the formal story of history is that you know, when, when we went, went round the world with, uh, well, when Magellan went round the world and when uh, Drake went round the world, they knew that there was um, something down there. Drake knew that you could go round the bottom of South America, uh, but there, there must be some giant landmass down there. And when, uh, just to uh, scoot ahead, when Captain Cook, so we're now talking the 1770s, he went round the world and he deduced that there would be a giant landmass there but it wasn't until 1820 when the russians actually the russians sent uh, an expedition down there and they landed on the the antarctic landmass and so that's when historians like to say this this heroic age of antarctic exploration began was then and it's quite often said that it ends with shackleton's last very last uh, expedition which is like what 1920 1922 something like that mm -hmm. so so that's sort of hundred odd years there um and, and but it comes to a, a head uh, towards the end of that period so even by 1905 1908 um no one had ever been to either the north pole or the south pole yeah. again north that's kind of surprising really isn't it yeah it's yeah, kind of surprising yeah, it, I think even now, actually, it's it remains the largest really uncharted area on the planet. And it made me laugh then what you said about Graham Hancock, because, I mean, he's that guy's convinced that there's a frozen civilization under there. He might be right as well. I don't know. But um, it's so gigantic. But that is interesting. I didn't realize it was discovered so late, actually. And I, I find it interesting, uh, amusing that uh, we were itching to get our hands on it as soon as it was discovered. You know, we've got to get, get the boys over, have a look around, you know. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's like the, the Royal Geographical Society. It was sort of they gave themselves the uh, charge of mapping the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it, I suppose it's a bit like the American, um, they've got a, a giant survey uh, body. I think it's in the in the American Navy that, you know, it's their responsibility to sort of map the world mm. and things. But, yeah, you're quite right. The Antarctic is unbelievably um, rem remote. I mean, there are other places in the world, like the, the Amazon Basin and stuff, where, I mean, our Earth is completely mapped by GPS, obviously, from, mm -hmm. from low Earth orbit. But actually, men on the ground, I think there are, surprisingly, I, I read an article, I think, by David Attenborough a few years ago, that there are actually quite a few places in the world where no one's ever been yet still. Uh, places in the Himalaya regions and, yeah, like the mm -hmm. Amazon. And anyway, loads of Antarctica is, um, yeah, just is so unbelievably unforgiving, it's, you know. Um, but one thing yeah. I'd say about the North Pole and the South Pole real quick is that the South Pole is, uh, there's a continental landmass there. It's a giant, you know, thousand, hundreds, hundreds, a hundred, couple of thousand miles wide with mountains. They're giant mountains. But the North Pole, there's no land there. It's just frozen sea, pack ice. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a completely different thing, completely different prospect. Um, and anyway, by, by sort of the early 1900s, um, in a lot of Europe and America, there was sort of this, um, yeah, like this race to see who could get there because they were pretty sure they could do it. Um, and, an, and an American had got to the North Pole first, um, Robert Peary, uh, mm -hmm. with a team of Inuits. Um, and Amundsen, the famous Amundsen, who will come up later, he, he wanted to get there. He realised he could sort of get close and get on the pack ice in the right direction and just float across the North Pole and claim it that way. But he was pipped by this American. Um, and that seemed, like, <laughs> that seemed like 1809 or something like that. Um, so that's, it's funny how that doesn't seem to hold, maybe it's just over here in the UK, I don't know, but it doesn't seem to hold the prestige that the South Pole later does. That's I don't know why. Quite interesting. I think you're quite right, yeah. I think possibly that the South Pole is sort of undeniably just technically more difficult, physically mm -hmm. more difficult. Um, I, th I think that's why. Um, but also because the race thing that developed 
um, it sort of went down in history a bit more than maybe it might have done because all this stuff we're going to talk about with Shackleton and Scott it did mm. play out in in the media and it was a big deal at the time, you know. Absolutely. Um, but with the uh, with, with the South Pole and 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 the North Pole there, they're, you know, two very completely different prospects. So now it was only really the South Pole that remained as the great prize, the last great prize of this age of heroic, uh, you know. Arctic and Antarctic exploration. It was like the, the, the great last prize. And so, yeah, the Brits tried to get there in, as I say, in early in that, uh, they tried in like 1901 with the ship, the Discovery. And that's Captain Scott's first um, attempt. And Shackleton was, as I say, and part she, of the crew. He was in that, right? So he was one of the, the crew members. Is yeah. that is this the Nimrod expedition or is that later? Is that That's later. later. That's, that's Shackleton Discovery. on his on his own. That's like 1908. So that's like a fair few oh, years later. Um, yeah, so as I say, there's these four big ones. I think we'll just concentrate on the two last ones of mm -hmm. these four. But oh, the first two of these four, if I quickly maybe run through those, because they're sort of important. They sort of feed off each other and they learn as they go along and, you know, all that sort of thing. So the first one, they get within, uh, well, well, maybe I should describe a little bit the uh, geography of, of Yeah, Antarctica. please do. Please do. Uh, as I say, it's like this, it's this giant land that's huge, you know, with, with mountains on it and everything. And all around it is um well as you can imagine the frozen sea uh pack ice uh, they always just call it pack don't they it's, you know, mm, the pack, you're, yeah. you're heading That's into right. the pack uh we see a uh, thick pack ahead um they always called icebergs just bergs don't they if you notice that's that. right yeah there pack were some bergs. <laughs> it was like this sort of calling uh, it took me a while to get used to that i wasn't sure if they were referring to the dog pack for a while but no yeah the pack ice <laughs> yeah yeah and so you have to time everything uh, with the the winter and the summer of course it's the southern hemisphere mm. so everything's the other way around so you know december and january is summer and that's your best shot when the ice is at its smallest to get clo as close to the land as you can if not actually land on on like solid land you'd be lucky to do that but um uh, so it's all about timing and and the months so you want to head down there in in our winter which is the antarctic summer um and so the discovery heads down there and actually we now know in height we can now see in hindsight that it got quite lucky it had quite an easy go of it um down there there's the ross sea um there's a, a great captain from a slightly earlier generation uh, Captain Sir Captain James Ross, I think it was. Lots mm -hmm. of things are named after him. There's the Ross uh, Island, Ross Island, and the Ross Sea, and uh, the Ross Ice Shelf. And when you come down, if you come down from sort of um, New Zealand, a lot of these uh, trips uh, headed out from New Zealand. You come down to the, the, the Ross Ice Shelf, and hopefully you can get close to the land <laughs> with this the pack fighting the pack. And uh, but anyway, the, this first expedition, the Discovery, they they get onto Antarctica and they try and make a few depots and they get that they get within it was not that close I mean 400 odd miles I mean it's maybe halfway there mm. a third of the way there something like that and they have to turn back it's just way too difficult they realize they've bitten off more than they can chew but one thing I'd want to say this about about that um is that this is really the first guys ever to head into Antarctica um you know the Russians went down there in 1820 and there'd been various people had you know gone around there and and, and hit the land but no one had ever really just hiked <laughs> straight into the middle mm -hmm. of Antarctica yeah. they didn't really know that all about all the gigantic mountain ranges that are there they didn't know that because in the middle of Antarctica is a, a higher plateau you have to go up like 9,000 10,000 feet it's like a giant wall of of, mm. of mountain that you have to go giant up ice, ice wall which is sort of 400,000 cubic miles of ice or something um it's a really unusual terrain, isn't it? I think I read at one point there are volcanoes and uh, these underwater rivers that have their own high and low tide systems. So completely foreign, of course, completely foreign ground. Yeah, there's a Mount Erebus there, which is just on the oh, the, 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 uh, the side of the Ross Ice Shelf, um, which is a which is a volcano mm -hmm. <laughs> in in Antarctica. Incredibly, gold. Uh, I think gold splattering, isn't it? I read somewhere that the flecks of sorry? gold. Oh really? Flex, yeah, a flex of gold. I'm not sure if it's Mount oh. Erebus, but one of them. So uh, yeah, quite the wonderland. Yeah, I mean, so to, I mean, it, people have probably seen, of course, seen pictures and things, and it's both terribly desolate, isn't it? But also mm. almost yeah. unspeakably beautiful sometimes. Sometimes at, at the same time, it's crazy, isn't it? Um, but what you have to do, you, you head into Antarctica, and it's sort of terrible going, and you hit this giant wall of mountains of the Trans Antarctic Mountain Range. And you have to find a way th through that. I mean, you could, if you were expert mountaineers and prepared for that, you could go over the mountains. But really what you need to do is find a way, 
you know, a path through. And uh, there's this glacier there, the Beardmore Glacier, uh, which they found even on that first trip uh, with the discovery. And you sort of head up this giant glacier, um, the Beardmore. But glaciers are, are incredibly dangerous places. You know, basically mm. it's, a, it's a crevasse field. Um, it, it's sort of trying to eat you. It's trying to kill you at every step. <laughs> I've heard people describe it like that, Randolph Fiennes and, and different you know, really? more modern people. Yeah, it's sort of a, a terrifying prospect. Um, and, and then uh, if you get past that, you get up the Beardmore, you're then on sort of the, the Antarctic higher plateau. And it's sort of quite flat, but it, it's, it's like being up on Everest. You're dying the whole time, more or less. <laughs> the mm. whole time you're up there, it's, uh, you know, nine, ten thousand feet, eight, nine thousand feet, and uh, obviously ridiculous conditions. Um, uh, but but they have to turn back, this first one, the Discovery in 1901. And one of the sort of headlines, one of the things to take away from it is that, because uh, you go in a big party, a shipload of guys, 20, 30 guys, but by the, you have a very small party will actually head out for the pole, any sort of pole attempt. And on this one, there was, uh, there was, um, Scott himself, Wilson, Dr. Wilson, who comes into it, and and Shackleton. And Shackleton, like, is the weakest one. He, like, gets a bit lame, apparently, the story, because when they get back, Scott publishes a, a, a story about it, the voyage of the discovery. Um, and in it, he says Shackleton was the weakest and got sort of lame and held them up, and they kind of had to turn back kind of because of him. Mm. And yes, now, that's, that's right. He sort of in slur, isn't it? That's, indicated that's... that he was like a, it was a bit of a dig, wasn't it? I always got the sense. Well, yeah, massive, really. I mean, mm. it's hard for us to imagine this. Sort of, it's the, the, the Victorian people. It's, you know, we're in the Edwardian period, but they're all Victorian yeah. people born and raised in. And something like that, a slight like that to someone like you or me is something you probably shrug off or laugh at almost straight away. But in, in their world, in their society, that's massive. That's massive to be like mm. the, the, the reason. It's like a huge slap in the face, really. Um, and so, yeah, if, if, well, a few years later, before we just go on to the Nimrod in 1908, maybe we should pause a bit there and talk about Shackleton and um, Scott, uh, the, the men, what sort of type of guys they are, sort of, you know, very different guys. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about Shackleton, his personality, but mm. just one quick thing before you do that. I would say, because obviously they clashed, they clash, it was a clash of personalities. But I think they, they they both come across as the type of person that goes out of their way to be um, accommodating and nice. They go to extreme yeah. lengths to um, not uh, rub up badly against people. You sort of need that in these Antarctic expeditions. So it's odd that they uh, locked horns, really odd to me. I'm not sure who to blame because they both seem like really good guys without being too cheesy about it. What do mm. you think? Well, just as you say, exactly, you just reminded me of, there's a passage actually where Shackleton, as we'll come on to, he finally reaches the whaling station at South Georgia. And um, so he talks about how they, they're completely dis disheveled, hungry, frostbitten, but they're all suddenly very aware of the fact that there may be ladies in the whaling station. And so they're, you know, they don't want to affront the ladies. And it just, just sort of made me laugh at that's the kind of really Edwardian gentlemanly conduct and all terribly nice, you know, terribly good chaps. And, uh, but yeah, really, there's clearly a lot of, I, I sense maybe a little, I don't know if it's jealousy, but um, I always got the sense that Scott was a little bit perturbed by Shackleton. Uh, I don't know whether intimidated is the right word, but there was a bit of, there's certainly healthy competition between them. But um, I think uh, Scott writing that article on Shackleton it definitely felt more to me like somebody who was slightly put out because of course Shackleton later goes further south doesn't he and um that that bugs Scott I think uh I don't know what do you yeah. make of that yeah no that that's exactly that's exactly it so uh to skip ahead a few years forward mm. 1908 Shackleton gets the sh a shot at his own expedition that the the, the uh, Admiralty um, give him his own command to go down there in the ship and all sorts. And so it's like it's, it's his big shot, the Nimrod. And, um, yeah, just to sort of uh, cut that one short, he gets within uh, perhaps, I think, 100 nautical miles or 90 miles to the pole. He gets up mm -hmm. the Beardmore. He gets up onto that higher plateau and um, gets uh, uh, really close. What year is this? Sorry, someone's uh, asking. 1908, 1908. Got it, got it. And, and he has to turn back, people say again, uh, it's an extremely brave decision to turn back when you get that close. I mean, yes. that's a super brave 
uh, you know, leadership mm. thing to do. Uh, it's not an easy one. And uh, so I actually had a comment on um, the, the, one of the earlier videos I did with the passage from Shackleton. And he had said, well, he was risking these men's lives. But I actually always got the sense that Shackleton took a lot of effort to mitigate risks for his men, you know, to get that close. But he wouldn't let them go any further because I always wondered whether Scott had that same whether whether he had that same kind of uh, boundary i'm not sure what you yeah we'll talk about that, about that uh, like just sort of whether mm. he put ambition above men's lives um i'll definitely talk about that in a, in a little bit um mm -hmm. uh, but what you said just the point you said about um uh, scott maybe being jealous a bit of of shackleton because yeah on that on that nimrod expedition shackleton gets the the record the world record for getting closest to the pole and and, and breaks scott's earlier record and Scott seems to be, yeah, definitely, sort of definitely jealous. I would say because he's on record as saying that, uh, well, he doesn't believe Shackleton's numbers that he got that close. <laughs> he, he says um, that's he called, it. Yeah, he calls uh, Scott calls Shackleton quote um, a professed liar and a plausible rogue, <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty strong. For I'm going to keep. I'm going to keep that one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's 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 but, I, but, I, but he also congratulated him before saying that, didn't he? I've read that he congratulated Shackleton, yeah. but he also yeah. said, "Yeah." I, I think <laughs> that quote backhanded. was um, was was meant to be in private. I think that was to somebody else in the Admiralty. Oh, came out sort of years later in a, in a memoir or something. But uh, no, formally he was, of course, happy for him. <laughs> um, Amazing. Um, so, so so yeah, I suppose we could just start on the, the famous Scott expedition because of course Let's go Shackleton. Scott, absolutely. Shackleton didn't reach the pole, so the, the great mm. goal is still there to be had. Mm. Um, and so it's sort of um, Scott's shot again in 1910. Um, it, the, the Admiralty fund another, yet another expedition. They, they kind of really want it. <laughs> they mm. really want that South Pole prize. There's a lot of money in it, isn't there? Just to um, ask, is it mostly, would you say it was mostly the British and the Norwegians? What, what, what are, you know, what are the other, what, what other interest is there in the South Pole from the continental countries or international. Yeah, no, that's 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 basically it for this season of nineteen ten to nineteen eleven. Yeah. Um, but there are, like I say, there are a few uh, select countries that are interested in it. Um, so, uh, what Belgium, France, Sweden, uh, Japan sent one. Uh, mm. America, I think, um, and and that's about it. Um, yeah, and, and anyway, at this point, sort of 1910, 1911, it's only. Um, Scott and Amundsen, the Norwegian party. But uh, before I go off about that on, on a tangent in, in a minute, <laughs> but he wasn't even, or just quickly to say, he wasn't even supposed to be down there. Um, he sort of changed his plans. He was meant to be going to the North Pole, Greenland or something like that. Right. And at the last minute changed his sort of secretly, not secretly, but his own backers, his own moneyed interests paying for his expedition, didn't even know that he's actually going to go to the South Pole and try and pip Scott, interesting um because it's a sort of a famous expedition you know everyone in the papers in britain at the time it's all sort of publicized and everyone's behind scott and it's all sort of you know gung-ho let's go for it um yeah uh so he, yeah he, he, sorry, tell, he sends him a telegram doesn't he just saying going south amundsen i think that's all it was yeah that's right there's a few sort of telegram stories um that, that, yeah yeah where amundsen they get in touch with each other because they yeah they, they both leave from sort of the from australasia um, I can't remember exactly where Amundsen leaves from, but um, Scott leaves from New Zealand, and um, and <clears throat> they, they they sort of make bases on different sides of the Ross Ice Shelf, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and and take different routes. Um, <clears throat> but I'll contrast it with what Am what, what Amundsen did, um, sort of in, in a minute. Um, yeah, so he's the the, the great the sort of doomed. Everyone knows it's sort of doomed, don't they? I'm not sort of spoiling it <laughs> i don't think it's a spoiler <laughs> no <laughs> you never know though um but yeah he goes down on the terra nova um and they have quite a bad trip on the way down there they take they take a load of ponies white siberian ponies and a whole bunch of dogs um these uh big then i don't think they're actually huskies amundsen has huskies um but he takes these big dogs for sledges and they actually also have two or is it three uh, motorised sleds, he describes them as. Uh, I can only imagine like a, a skidoo type thing, an early skidoo. But again, it's 1910, so it must be very sort of primitive early thing. Um, so anyway, they've mm. got these sleds, horses, uh, ponies and dogs. 
and they plan to sort of manhaul a lot of their sledges. That be becomes a big thing, doesn't it? Manhauling. Um, and that's mm. just literally what, what really, it says it really on the tin. Yeah. Uh, just men hauling these giant sleds full of provisions, their tent, their, their food and, and the fodder for, their an for the animals and all sorts. And it's, you know, incredibly physically hard. Mm. Um, and anyway, yeah, it's just... <laughs> This uh, this uh, Scott party, it just seems like there's loads of adventures all along the way. Uh, so the seas are really terrible when they head down from New Zealand. And at one point, um, some of the dogs, because all the ponies and the dogs just sort of live on the deck in the open. And at one point in terrible seas, one of the dogs gets flown, uh, flung over the side um, and lost, of course. Oh, um, I didn't know that. That's uh, and then and then there's another one that gets thrown over the side and then the next wave <laughs> throws it back onto the boat <gasps> no <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and oh, there's Lord. just actually tons of stories just like that where you're like wow really <laughs> really that's sort of unbelievable i believe um, it but yeah oh, no i completely nice. believe it yeah oh, no i completely believe it but it's just like um just like those odd things that reality throws up as sort of sometimes strange and fiction in, mm. in a way sort of million to one shot of things that happen um um but yeah i mean so, so what else goes there and they they nearly get caught when well, they do get caught in in the, in the pack ice and for a lot of the a lot of the pages of scott's diaries scott's journals which were found um when he was found uh, a lot of it talks about their struggles with the ice um mm. getting out on the ice and snow blindness and and sort of uh, the beauty of of the sun on the horizon and the different icebergs and um, like lots of days of just like worrying about the ship being crushed by the flows and going out on the on, on the ice and skiing and playing a bit of football even sometimes. And, and yeah, that's some of the rare footage we've got is is the just it's amazing seeing that, isn't it? But a, a lot of time to kill actually whilst they're waiting for the ice to to clear. It's it's a lot of weeks and even months of tedium to fill, I suppose, as well. Yeah, sometimes, absolutely. And and you get that feel for, um, again, maybe sort of the Victorian Edwardian uh, people that are, um, obviously they had no telecommunications or any TV mm -hmm. or radio or anything. So they're actually used to, perhaps compared to us, a life with a lot less, I suppose a so, boring yeah. boring life is one way of putting it, but just with less stimulus, a lot less stimulus. So the idea of spending uh, very long days and nights just reading or something like that it's like you know it's not that mm. crazy but still yeah the monotony i mean it can send and did or does sometimes send guys crazy <laughs> you know actually crazy um but anyway this, uh, scott does finally get to the, the land um yeah that they camp under mount erebus and actually yeah, he wants to he, he wants uh, scott wants to use the same camp that he used that the um that the discovery used in 1901 because it was such a brilliant camp and they did loads of work on it back then. Um, and he can't get to it because of the flows, because of the pack. And he's terribly disappointed. Um, again, these people are very, very stoic. They will very rarely say, you know, oh, I'm really disappointed about this, really gutted that this happened or that happened, or we've been set back here or there. But um, Scott does say a few times, like, um, terribly disappointed we can't land at the Discovery Base. <laughs> but anyway, they, they make a base not that far away, and it's sort of, in the shadow of Mount Erebus, this giant volcano, on the just on the side of the Ross Ice Shelf, and so yeah, the the adventures begin, and the, the, some of the ponies they've got are, are, are lame, some have died already, and um. Um, and um, it, well, what the plan is is that that summer they will try and put out these depots because you can't just walk straight to the pole; <laughs> it's like uh, eight hundred miles or nine hundred odd miles, something like mm. that. So. And again, up this glacier, across the mountains, and across a higher plateau. Uh, so what you have to do is make a string of depots um, or camps or supply depots. And they made, I can't remember how many, there are seven or eight or nine, and they've all got names like One Ton Depot, uh, Shambles Depot, yeah. uh, Three Degree Depot. Uh, it, they've all got names. And so you have to put these out sort of the year before <laughs> and, and fill them up with supplies and things. Right. And, and for your attempt the following summer. Um, so that's a whole thing in and of itself. That's a whole, a whole arduous um, story. And they do it, and, and, and uh, Scott and some of his party nearly, uh, I mean, it's really serious going. Some, they nearly die a couple of times there. And, I mean, there's just loads of stories. Like, for example, there was one time they're walking a, a dog, a, a sled pulled by dogs across 
the snow and they didn't realize it's a crevasse and they fall in um <laughs> and these dogs are sort of suspended there across this crevasse and um and mm. and yeah it's just like a, a really long sort of um arduous <laughs> story to get them all out alive and he just about does um and they they they, they have these sort of quaint um things they have those like for, for example they talk a lot about um an alpine rope like it's as though it's a special magical thing that will never snap <laughs> under any pressure we'll use the alpine rope to pull them out <laughs> but anyway yeah oh look, there's a there's a picture of the ponies you notice oh, did you, you saw that did you oh good i, I was just that, trying yeah. to share it oh i'll put it back up then yeah the alpine rope just just uh <laughs> i don't know whether these are sort of um colloquial names between them because they do do that I, I, in shackleton they sort of various camps they just rename like the ritz and the savoy a bit of in joke in sort of banter but yeah who knows what the alpine rope is who knows <laughs> <laughs> yeah they um well, well a, a, a note then on the animals the, the ponies because shackleton had taken ponies on his expedition with the Nimrod a couple of years earlier. And he'd said, these are like Siberian ponies. Um, and he'd said that the white ones he'd had were like the most hardy. So Scott insisted that he'd have only white Siberian ponies. Um, but, uh, well, the long and short of it is ponies or horses, uh, uh, the, the hoofed foot is terrible for Antarctica. <laughs> It's just not. It's just not the right thing. It's not the right really? tool for the job. Yeah, yeah. It's not the right tool for the job. Amundsen didn't have ponies. Well, um, I was you, just. You, you don't take ponies to mm. Antarctica now, really. There, there's so, no. You have to take all the fodder. Um, it's yeah. yeah it's course. not the right. It's not the right decision. Sorry, Poor little horses. No, I was just wondering. It's just what you said. So actually, Shackleton had mentioned the white ones, and so he ordered a ton of white ones. How interesting. So it goes to show that he, for all he says about Shackleton, he does obviously hold his him in esteem to some extent yeah well they will definitely always try and learn from each other um every expedition that goes out they, they mm. always say that it's always um touted as uh the most up-to-date scientific expedition ever yeah um, you mentioned right at the beginning the franklin expedition which is a lot earlier that's like 1840s i think and that was right. to do with um the northwest passage trying to find a way through um, well, the Northwest Passage from the Atlantic uh, to the Pacific through northern Canada. Um, and there isn't really one. Um, I think you can get through there if uh, you've got sort of a modern um, ice cutting ship, <laughs> if the conditions are just right. Uh, but essentially, well, the Franklin Expedition was a complete failure. Everyone died. Uh, everyone died. It was, mm. <laughs> um, uh, but that was, you know, the most up to date. <laughs> most scientific thing. And and these uh, Shackleton and Scott expeditions are the same thing. They will try and make it, you know, they're not stupid. They're not, they're not, you know, they're not trying to die of exposure no, of uh, up not. there. You know, they're trying to do the best they can. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, so at the time in, in 1910, Scott sort of thinks, I suppose he's thinking it, well, his thinking is, we'll take, we'll, we'll try and cover all the bases. We'll take dogs, we'll take, and we'll take ponies, and we'll try these new sleds, these motorised, skidoo things mm. um it, his thinking was we'll cover all the bases um and it was just w w when you know historians look back on it that, that was just sort of the wrong decision um i mean maybe just to talk about amundsen briefly uh, at yes. this point he just took dogs lots and lots of dogs and i assume i assume um, they were huskies or some yeah you know yeah. as a scandinavian because of course i i was also thinking they they obviously could ski quite well i don't know whether our men were skiing like they were or, or what but no well that's exactly they get, that's, the exa <laughs> that's exactly the thing amundsen was uh, a, 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 an expert skier everyone he chose for his expedition right. were were expert at, at their jobs uh, they were they'd all been um on sort of, most of them been on previous expeditions um to like greenland norway's got a big uh, history of uh do doing you know survival stuff in in greenland and the and the Arctic, the North Pole stuff, they were heavily involved in in that kind of obviously. And so their guys were just uh, trained by um, Inuit, um, mm. you know, <laughs> the best there are at yes, sort of, of uh, uh, dog teams. Absolutely. And so and so Amundsen's attempt was sort of this uh, crack unit of of dog teams. Everyone knew exactly what they were doing, kind of thing. Um, 
can go into a little bit more detail, but um, so that, that's what he did. Well, here's one example. Amundsen, Amundsen gets down there and they, they start pulling their sleds and he realises um, these sleds are just too heavy. So he orders his carpenter guys to just uh, shave down these wooden sleds. And so where they were like 165 pounds or something, they're now like uh, 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. the sled, it might not sound like a huge thing, but in fact, that is stuff like that can be the difference between life and death. So, OK, you've got this crack <laughs> unit of like uh, professional skiing dog team guys that are actually thinking, you know, super logically. And then you've got our guys that are just um, a lot of money is thrown at it and they're trying their best. But it's just sort of a scattergun effect. They're just trying everything. And a lot of them aren't expert skiers. They're trying out stuff for the first time. Or, or these Siberian ponies get down there and haven't really pulled sledges before over mm. ice. So they're just trying everything for the first time. It's kind of crazy. They did pretty well considering. Uh, it, also, it also reminds me of um, Shackleton at one point when he gets back way after to London, they realised that the, the leather boots they had, the manufacturer had basically filled them with cardboard and things. But uh, a lot. it always amazes me how kind of primitive, I suppose, just what they're wearing is as well. It doesn't look warm enough. <laughs> Not at all, not at all. As I, I was just reading a bit about that um, the other day where um, in, in Scott's journal, he says something about, um, uh, he says something like, I still think our, our modern scientific clothing is better than the, the furs, like the reindeer furs that the Inuits wear. I'm still, I still think that's the case. Um, or, or he says something like, oh, perhaps their furs might be better than ours when you get to sort of minus 40 or 50. Um, and we now know it's way better. Mm. way way better than what they were wearing they're wearing like well you can see from the pictures it's it's weird isn't it it looks like a jumper and a smock yeah um and a little but, hat which is just like a bag <laughs> yeah well a lot of them these guys are i mean it's a cliche it's an obvious thing but these guys are hardy super hardy i mean mm. and it's sort of a point of um uh, you know uh, uh, that they try and outdo each other a little bit i think uh, it's not explicitly said but it's sort of a bravado thing. So, for example, um, there's one guy in, in Scott's team, uh, Bowers, and he's sort of the, the hardiest <laughs> when it comes to just out and out cold. And they say, well, even when uh, guys like Scott and his his hardest guys, his most seasoned guys, even when they have to put their balaclavas on, um, this Bowers is still just walking around with just a, a woolly hat on and his ears open to the cold. And no one can understand how he can do it. <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and it's funny It's funny how things like frostbite affect people differently. You know, the same guys that have had the same amount of food and energy, one guy will get frostbite and another one won't. And it's sort of yeah, a little bit of a... Also, some of the younger ones tree. suffered worse than the old, you know, the old sea dog type things, it's, uh, the seasoned ones. It's interesting. That's definitely true. Um, yeah. I was just They were saying that the uh, your prime age for this sort of thing is between 30 and 40. Uh, the, the the guys that are sort of 23, 26, yeah, they they will get frostbite or or their their sort of psychological uh, the side of the psychological side of it, they'll be more impacted by that. They'll give up basically easier. Um, but yeah, just the out and out frostbite thing. It does seem that uh, guys are sort of in in the best window between 30 and 40 on that. It's funny. It's like altitude altitude sickness. You know, you could get sort of a quite an unhealthy sort of obese person. And they can handle altitude just so much better than someone that's like a, a you know really? a, a marathon runner sometimes. Yeah, because it's it, yeah it's to mm. do with that. Well, in that instance, it's to do with the amount of oxygen your blood can handle. But anyway, uh, the point is, mm -hmm. it's, for no real rhyme or reason, some guys can just handle cold better than others. Um, and well, I mean, all that will come up. Um, but yeah, so in the first summer, they they have to make a, a hut when they bring on their ship all the things they need to make like a giant hut. <laughs> and uh, and they build it in about two weeks flat and they, they start making these depots um, up towards the Beardmore Glacier and beyond. And they do that. And, um, you know, there's a, as I say, there's a lot of adventures along the way, all sorts of different things. Like there's one point when a couple of the ponies get uh, somehow stranded on a bit of pack ice that floats out to sea um, and they can see them. You know, all the men can see these, oh. these couple of ponies and they, they try oh. really hard to save them. Oh, um, that's so sad. <laughs> Yeah, it's really sad. <laughs> oh, that's heartbreaking. I should laugh, but I was so tragic. 
Oh, well, it's all really, really harsh what happens to all the animals, really. I mean, they bring loads of dogs. He says he brings loads of work dogs, um, but he also brings one a collie bitch, they say. Mm. So I guess it's just like that's more like a pet. And at one point they didn't realise it was obviously pregnant, but at one point it just gives birth to a litter of puppies. Um, and then it kills them all for some reason, just sort of sits on them and smothers them all. It's like, oh, great. Oh. Thanks, Captain Scott. I like that little bit of detail. It's like just two lions in, yeah. the, uh, in, in his journal. Oh, thanks. Uh, it's, yeah, so nice, it's so brutal, nice isn't it? Yeah. yeah Dead, it gone, see ya, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, because... Uh, I mean, these ponies, like 1.1 of them basically gets its nose ripped off and oh. uh, they, they they suffer pretty terribly. Because um, even though they, they're like Siberian ponies and they are used to, you know, obviously extreme conditions, the Antarctic's kind of a, another level. Um, mm, yeah, mountainous and also carrying all the, uh, of what they were, you know, I don't know what they were feeding them either. Uh, yeah, well, they had fodder for them, oats, and mm. also they had to bring everything with them. Um, you know, it's quite, again, strategically, it's kind of a silly thing to bring ponies to the Antarctic. <laughs> um, but in, anyway, uh, yeah, so I suppose, I suppose just skip ahead, they have a sort of a long, dark winter. As you say, it comes in that thing where these long, long, or well, completely dark days and nights for, for months on end in the Antarctic. And you just have to, you can't really do anything. You can't really go outside when the weather comes in and there's blizzards, um, it's sort of terribly dangerous to stray even a few hundred yards from the from, from your hut. Um, and so, yeah, there's these really dark uh, months where they have to sort of uh, live out their days and they sort of fill their time very in a very sort of stoic, very British Edwardian way, you know, giving mm. each other lectures about each other's field of interest and, um, uh, yeah, just all sorts of stuff. It's very, very wholesome, really. I mean, it's all... I think, um, and uh, what was the next summer so comes they're, around? They're, they're just waiting, waiting for the imp it to improve conditions to improve. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I suppose one little mm. anecdote it might be worth saying is that at one point during the winter, I think it might be the, the, the springtime, but one point one of their one of the party, not one of the the sort of famous five that make the final push to the pole, but one of their other guys. Uh, goes outside the hut for some reason, I can't remember why, to get something from one of the other stores or something, and he gets lost um, in the darkness and the blizzard. Apparently it's really, really easy to do. If the you can't see the stars or the moon or anything, um, and there's no real uh, sort of uh, features around to, mm -hmm. to navigate by, you can get disorientated, even if you, you're experienced, you can get disorientated apparently really easily. And you can't see, sometimes they say you can't, it's not that you can't see a few yards ahead of you, you can't see your hand in front of your face, literally. Uh, and so anyway, this guy gets lost out in the cold a few hundred yards from the from the hut. And he's out there for sort of five or six hours and it's remarkable he didn't die and he gets frostbite in his hands and a little bit in his face. Um, but I, I mention that because, uh, yeah, I suppose you do really need to appreciate that when the weather comes in, in Antarctica, when you're in a, a, an Antarctic blizzard, it's really no joke. It's not like you can just try harder to walk through it. <laughs> it's not like That's that. It. It's, mm. it's, it's death if you try, um, more or less. Um, so I suppose that's something to keep in mind. So, yeah, they're just waiting for the Antarctic summer to roll around again to have a shot at the pole. And so I suppose just to, keep, to, to, to skip ahead, that's what they do. Mm. Um, and, and do they, they, how are their supplies at this point? What kind of things are they eating each day? Do they have, are they running low or I assume they've taken enough so much as they can anticipate with them to, to eat and drink? Yeah, no, I mean, they're fine for provisions uh, at, at this point. Their base camp has got tons, literally tons of stuff, of, of biscuit. <laughs> they talk a lot about biscuit. Yeah, they do, don't <laughs> um, they? Yeah. <laughs> but they've got loads of stuff. I mean, at one point in the in the winter, they have uh, they they have a little drink. There's some champagne. They say there's a liqueur Ooh, or something. Typical. And on special occasions, on, on um, Scott's birthday, they say something about chocolates and jelly okay. or something. Um, and yeah, they've got stores of mutton, um, obviously brought from New Zealand originally. But they also eat a lot of um, things they catch there: seal and penguin and fish mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, so food's not really a problem for the main 
body of the of, of the expedition. It's only on these final depot trips and back where uh, food and actually fuel oil, the oil you need to make uh, to cook food and heat, um, that ends up being really the killer. Is that they they they, they bugger up their calculations on how much oil they're going to need. Um, but yeah, so that they in in, in the summer they. They, they sort of go for it um and you know they're aware Amundsen is also trying again in that season so but but Scott makes the decision explicitly says a couple of times you know I've got to just do my plan I, I can't race Amundsen because you know I'm putting men's lives on the line if I okay. want to do that um but I suppose it is also important to say at this point that Scott did realize that he was on the edge of um, safety or, or beyond really beyond uh, the edge of safety mm -hmm. he knew that he really needed more dogs he needed more ponies um, they lost one of these skidoos almost straight away they got it off the ship and it just fell into oh. some slush and then fell through the pack and just oh. dropped, to the, dropped to the bottom of the ocean <laughs> And just brought, gone. Yeah, it's just gone, just like that. Um, but that's, uh, that's it about the ice. It's so unpredictable. Uh, you know, you walk forward a few metres and then suddenly one of the men will just plop down and disappear and then they're all trying to reach in after him. It, it happens quite a number of times, doesn't it? Or a sudden crack will appear 20 foot long. And Yeah, like crevasse fields. Yeah, it's, as I say, it's, uh, well, it's an extreme, it sounds mm -hmm. a really obvious thing to say, but no, it's an it's extremely true. dangerous environment. Yes. Um, extremely dangerous environment. Oh, especially... We just tend to think of it as flat snow, or I do in my mind at first, but it really <laughs> isn't, is it? Well, especially that that Beardmore Glacier. Um, yeah. Amundsen goes up a completely different glacier. Um, but, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's kind of uh, crazily dangerous, <laughs> especially and, and especially if you don't know what you're doing, because, I mean, I already said it earlier, but I'll, I'll stress it again. They're kind of the first guys... Um, you know, it's it's not a completely virgin. You know, Shackleton and Scott have been up on that higher plateau before, but it's more or less un uncharted, unmapped. It's more or less um, just heading out into the unknown still. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of, it is extremely brave. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Uh, sure. So yeah, so on the uh, the actual the, the actual trip to try and reach the pole. Um, it's hard going. Um, and Amundsen hits a window because just to cut to the chase, Amundsen gets there first by about two weeks, I think it is. Um, and he just gets lucky. Um, I say, I'm not trying to belittle what he did. I'm saying he just got lucky. Uh, it's not that at all. What I mean is, um, he did get lucky with a little window of the weather. And that's what it's all about. I mean, even today, quite often, you need to, or if you want to uh, summit Mount Everest, you need a little window of the right weather. There's no other way. There's, there's just simply no other way. If you want to do that thing, <laughs> you need the weather to be kind to you mm -hmm. when when you when you try for the final push, you know? Yeah. Um, and so Amazon got lucky in a sense that on his push up there, he hit sort of this nice little pocket of, of weather and uh, and his dog team was highly professional. You know, they're, they're extremely good at what they were doing. And, um, and, and, and well, one of the things I say, it's a little bit ruthless. They, they would kill their own dogs to feed to the remaining dogs on their way back. Um, so everything's worked out to like the most efficient thing. And, and don't care at all about engineering, the engineering. Yeah. yeah, I think the treatment of the dogs is a bit more, uh, not cutthroat, but maybe lacked the sentimentality, which probably worked better for them, really. But Definitely. yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, the sentimentality thing. Um, no, these are these are uh, sort of uh, uh, beasts of burden. These are these are uh, work animals. Uh, they're not pets. They're, well, that's how they looked at it, you know. Um, there's a funny bit in the um, in a in the film uh, "The Man Who Would Be King." I don't know if you've seen that with Michael Caine and Sean Connery. It just sprung mm -hmm. to mind when um, there's a character in it, a, a Gurkha, uh, Billy Fish, the Gurkha, and this mm -hmm. is in Victorian times. And one of the things he characterizes Englishmen or the Brits for being sort of crazy. It, to, to his mind is that we all line up and go into battle in lines marching left right left right <laughs> and, and, and and we give names to dogs oh interesting like, like, like that's <laughs> to some cultures or some people in the world um just that is kind of yeah. crazy a bit silly um <laughs> so some people look at their dogs in a very different way and um yeah Shackleton and Scott treated them 
very much like pets. They're like really oh, yeah. upset when they die and things. And, they and they're quite like, sweet as well, yeah. And they try and nurse them back to health when they look like they're oh. going down and, and all this sort of thing. And they give them names and nicknames. And, yeah. And, and um, yeah, it's really quite sweet, really. And they get like, they, um, they also build them little, I think in, in Shackleton's uh, memoirs, he refers to them as dog glues, like igloos, basically. And at one point he says, uh, when he's doing his night watch, he just looks over and sees a little paw just um, tucked outside of one of them, really kind of <laughs> like Lady Muck, you know, the <laughs> spoilt, spoilt doggos in their, their, <laughs> little, their little warm dog glue. It's very cute. But yeah, they're very sentimental about them, which is nice. Yeah, they build them sort of um, wind shelters. Or yeah. well, one story, I suppose, um, um, puts it quite well is they've got this one particular pony, um, Weary Willy, he's called. Oh. <laughs> the poor, poor Weary <laughs> Willy who's worked to death. Um, at, one point, he, at one point, he looks like he's, um, he's, he's, he's in trouble, like he's going mm. down. So they sort of they sort of take him to one side and they build him his own personal wind uh, break. And, oh. and they put blankets over him and they warm oh, up some dear. oats. They warm oh, up some oats for him. And the, the, a couple of them sit with him all night. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, and so that's just a million miles away from the way Amundsen and, and, and you know, like I say, many other Absolutely. cultures would, would think about their mm. uh, pack animals. Um, uh, he, even I, when I was uh, rereading that the other day, I did think that's a bit... That's a bit much, like, um, because he yeah. was going to die. Like, it's obvious there's no way I know. Weary Willy was going to make it out of the Antarctic. <laughs> <laughs> there's no way, right? Um, he, he was doomed from the start. It's a bit like that sounds yeah. like a um, Grimm's Brothers fairy tale, that, you know, <laughs> doomed Weary Willy. It's so tragic to begin with. <laughs> well, that, well, that was one other thing I'd say. You mentioned earlier that, that this uh, accusation uh, that Scott. Uh, treated human life uh, lightly or, or his ambition was outweighed his, um, you, you know, how much he thought about mm. the value of human life. I, I think if you read the journals, th there's just no way that sticks. There's I no didn't way. believe it, I must say. No, because no. Like, the way they're so <laughs> emotionally tied mm. to their dogs and ponies, mm. um, yeah, of course they would do absolutely everything for for their own companions and party not to die of course um yeah well i that's think really, that's um, it's, yeah there's a lot of sentimentality and and a lot of love invested in it as well isn't there yeah. undoubtedly a lot of com camaraderie or comradeship i suppose yeah yeah and it's funny actually because these dogs and ponies are uh kind of vicious they're kind of assholes <laughs> <laughs> they're really horrible <laughs> like these dogs like they give them nicknames and love them names and treat them like pets but they're vicious as hell they're like they'll um that they, they attack each other like at one point there was one of the ponies <laughs> was a, a little bit weak or something and the dogs just try and take it down and they will um yeah they were so naughty uh, and they will like try and attack each other but really viciously like drawing blood ripping chunks off of each other oh and, stuff. And, and a couple of times the dogs get one or two dogs get lost somehow um well oh. at some point you you can let them off their their leash entirely because they're not going to go anywhere um mm. but a, a couple of them do get lost somehow in the wilderness and um at one point they come across it like a month later it sort of comes walking out of, of the wilderness it's got blood all around its maw and so it's obviously been able to hunt oh and kill God. um god, god knows what probably small seals maybe penguins yeah. something like that um, a killer whale, so, so, um, <laughs> so these dogs are really badass dogs. I mean, really, they're, they're not pets, you know, household pets, no. we would know, not remotely, you know. Um, but, they're, but they're treated, they're spoiled rotten, really, aren't they? Yeah, <laughs> wherever they can be, I think, yeah. But also treated terribly bad, like they're, they're you know, they're worked to death, really, mostly, mm. mostly, anyway. Mm. It's funny you should mention killer whales. I mean, a quick, quick word on that. It's really interesting, some really interesting descriptions. They, I get the impression that... That they think of them as like uh, clever sharks. Um, yes, yeah, uh, hunting the, them. Yeah, yeah, because a few times they are, they are out on the pack, and these killers like deliberately, you know, come up from underneath and try and smash the bit of ice they're on to try and get them, just like they would to a you know a, a porpoise or you know a seal or something. They try to do that to one of the dog teams at one point, and the men and the Ooh. dogs get get away because obviously they appreciate what's going on and they're. A, bit more uh, maneuverable than a, a seal 
And so they the, the men get away, but the, then they see the the killer whales poking their heads up out of the water to see what happened. And, and Scott says, you know, you can see intelligence in their eyes. You can see that they knew exactly what they were doing, that they were working as unison. Um, and you know, because of course a shark has got the mind of a fish. Yeah, it's pretty dumb. But these killer whales, they, <laughs> these killer whales are, are, are mammals. They're way cleverer. They they really are deliberately working in unison to do stuff. Um, which is you know, a whole different kettle of fish. And Scott says, you know, we've got to treat them with respect because, well, obviously. Well, uh, th th funnily enough, that's exactly like Shackleton. He he also he says that they were actually a constant source of anxiety um, because, of course, they might mistake them for seals. But um, he he actually talks. Of, he, he, I've got this bit here. He said these aggressive creatures were to be seen often in the lanes and pools and we were always distrustful of their ability or willingness to discriminate between seal and man a lizard-like head would show while the killer gaze along the flow with wicked eyes then the brute would dive to come up a few moments later under some unfortunate seal reposing on the ice and big blocks would be of ice would be tossed onto the flow of the surface smashed up by a blow from beneath and he says that the force that had been exercised was astonishing slabs of ice three feet thick thick and weighing tons had been tented upwards where the killer whale had smashed a hole um i think that at one point one of the young young fellows who's trying to the scientists are terrible because they're always wandering off to try and get samples of things but he, he sort of waded into his waist one day and this this killer whale <laughs> rose right up beside him and he Shackleton writes how he poked up his ugly head just as you just as you said they were watching to see what happened to the dogs it, like he poked up the ugly head and they can hear the their them blowing at night the, the hissing um he talks about how occasionally the ghostly shadows of silver snow and petrol black uh, flashed near us and we can hear them uh, with their short sharp hisses like sudden escapes of steam can you imagine just sleeping with that around you knowing it could smash underneath you at any point yeah it's terrifying it is terrifying <laughs> I, I, mean, I know they're lovely and funny well people say of course they've never attacked humans but I, I, whether or not they would mistake them for seals is very possible i suppose but yeah they were frightened of them i will say yes yeah, quite rightly i mean i think uh, scott says uh they just eat anything that's that they can Mm. Um, they're just hunting anything that's small enough to be hunted at all times. That they're, they're never their appetite is never satiated. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, and they're sort of kind of like this terrifying, clever giant shark thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's horrible. It's, it's like monster, a um, bit of a monster. I won't yeah, go near an orca. They call them. Uh, he keeps calling them. Um, what does he call them? Gladiator orcas. Ooh. Oh, yes, reason. that's yeah. Is that one of the breeds um, or something? I've I've read that as well. Yeah, I'm not sure why, but he does say that a number of times. Calls them mm. that. Um, but yeah, they, they yeah. definitely do work, in, and they feel like they get this. They feel like they're watching them or hunting them, essentially. Whether that's mm -hmm. true or not, I don't know. But they're probably <laughs> curious, I guess. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to be sleeping near that, though. No way. No, no. Well, that is a terrifying thing when you, whenever you're camping on on the pack, you know that there's only a few feet of ice, and then there's an ocean below you. <laughs> It, yeah, you, they say you kind of try to not think about it too much. I mean, that comes up much more immediately in the in the in the Shackleton story when you talk yes. about that. Um, but maybe if I just cut to the uh, Scott sort of yeah, the, please, sort, please sort of continue. the more famous yeah. bit, you know, they realise they that they do get to the pole, um, but they are pipped by like a couple of weeks by Amundsen. So it's, it's it's a couple of weeks, is it? He actually because yeah. I was wondering, do they have? They can't know that until they get there. Presumably, there's an, they're not in contact with anyone outside. I suppose of their group. Yeah, no, that's it. That's exactly. It. I've got the passage yeah. here actually. Um, oh, please, from, yeah. from Scott's uh, journal. Uh, let's see. So it's uh, okay. Uh, Tuesday, January the sixteenth, Camp sixty eight, minus twenty three degrees. Uh, it says. <clears throat> The worst has happened, or nearly the worst. We marched well in the morning and covered seven and a half miles. Noon sight showed us at latitude 89 degrees, 42 minutes south. And we started off in high spirits in the afternoon, feeling that tomorrow would see us at our destination. About the second hour of the march, Bow with sharp eyes detected what he thought was a cairn. He was uneasy about it, uh, but argued it would it must be a strategist, which is um, just ice, really. Um, Half an hour later, we detected a black speck ahead. Soon we knew this could not be a natural snow feature. 
We marched on, found that it was a black flag tied to a sledge bearer near to the remains of a camp, sledge tracks and ski tracks going and coming, and the clear trace of dogs' paws, many dogs. This told us the whole story. The Norwegians had forestalled us and are the first to the pole. It is a terrible disappointment, and I am very sorry for my loyal companions. Many thoughts come and much discussion we have had. Tomorrow we must march on to the pole and then hasten home with all the speed we can compass. All the daydreams must go. It will oh. be a wearisome return. We are descending in altitude. Certainly also the Norwegians found an easy way up. End quote. Um, oh. So, yeah, it's... it's uh, How I mean, demoralising. Yeah, sort of terribly demoralising, yeah. Mm -hmm. But suppose you have a pic that picture, do you? I do have it. Yeah, of, I was just the, looking the, for the it, five, actually. Um, sort of at the pole. So, yeah, they realise like a day's march out, they realise that they've been beat. Uh, but sort of, of course, they go on to still go to the mm. uh, the geographical pole. Uh, quick, quick thing, might just say this: there's, there's uh, people might know that there's the geographical South Pole and North Pole, and then there's the magnetic North and South Pole, and they're different things. We're not interested in the magnetic poles; it's just the, the geographical one. <laughs> um, yes, um, yes. So I just thought I'd quickly, I'll just quickly get the picture there. I mean, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah. So there's one. This one here. Yeah, yeah. That's so, it's uh, and they—I mean, I don't. It's hard to say how they look. They look terribly sunburnt, actually. And of, of I think yeah. the other one is uh, this one here. Of course, you get the. Well, if you go back to the other one. There you go. Um, so they're at the it's pole there, I believe. Um, yeah, you can sort of see in their faces that they're terribly gutted. <laughs> to put it mildly, they do you look it? Um, yeah, like. Uh, everything the, the, the whole point of their lives sort of sort of at least this well yeah segment of their lives is is um you know it's they've been yeah, it's disappointing um, they put their lives on the line and uh, and it's sort of for a failure because they are only really interested in what they call the primacy being first <laughs> yeah of course that really is the be all and end all that's the prize isn't it for them, yeah for them yeah um so yeah they're terribly disheartened mm. and of course this is a very uh Sad image. They all die. They're all they're all dead. They're dead men, mm. and uh, they probably knew it. They probably knew it, or they think... well, well, they definitely knew that they were in a tight, tight survival situation to get back. Everything, everything was right on the limit. Least yeah. of all their own um, physical ability. You can see uh, 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 Oates on the left there. He's sort of got his weight on one leg. Um, and they this say, one, hang on, which one? This one here? On the left, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, and he gets a bad foot, um, uh, mm. frostbite. Um, I thought he was just being camping. And, and, <laughs> and some say that already he's, because he keeps it secret from them for a bit too long, really. Um, oh. And then some say that, that he's got his weight on one leg there, might, might, he's probably already suffering from it. But there are, uh, so some have said, I don't know if I agree with this next thing I'm going to say. I don't mm. think I do, but. There's still an element there or something. Someone said that if they'd been first, if they if Amundsen, they had beat Amundsen, um, they might have got home. That, that I wondered their, that. I that wondered. Their whole, yeah, the whole psychological side of it would have been completely different and um, and that maybe the psychological blow of being beaten mm. was uh, played into it at least maybe for Evans anyway. Um, Evans is one of, which one of these, sorry? The I'm right, right it's Evans, I think. Right. I, might, I might be wrong about this. Um, mm. but, um, and these, yeah, men and, are all, and, and, these are sort sorry. of like seconding. Sorry, the, the, these men here are all obviously very, very good explorers, but they're they're all sort of second in command to Scott. Yeah, so Scott's the leader, and they've mm. all got different um, d different responsibilities. So Oates was meant to be, uh, or what he calls <laughs> sweet, really. Uh, uh, Scott calls Oates the soldier because he is a a, a captain. Mm. Um, of course, in the soldier, and he was meant to be in charge of the ponies, all things horse related. Um, oh, and dear. and uh, one of the other ones, Evans, I think he's just a, 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 a I say just, but he was a sailor. Um, and anyway, they've, they've got loads of different jobs. You know, there's like a carpenter and there's uh, guys that stoke the fire for the ship, guys yeah. that just um, do, uh, there's a, a cook. And anyway, in these expeditions, you take different people to do different specific roles. And then you take the strongest ones for the, the pole. And it doesn't necessarily matter what they're, job was mm -hmm. you pick the strongest guys at that point so 
Um, yeah, you don't have out and out guys that it's their whole job just to head for the pole. Like you, no, of course you, you do, yeah. but like so nowadays expeditions where someone wants to do that, like Ranulph finds or something, you know, there's a whole team behind him uh, j just for like this really specific thing. Whereas they're they're also doing I have, we haven't said this, but they're also doing quite a lot of scientific stuff, all sorts of survey type stuff, <laughs> trying to read the weather meticulously all the time and and trying to describe new animals and uh, you know that one of their parties is just really into um uh, uh parasites that live in the bellies of animals and and they've got like a couple of artists that just do sketches you know really really good edwardian era sketches that are almost photo yeah. quality you know that yes. sort of thing yes someone i saw um, them had to double check and they they were actually pictures but i thought were photos quite amazing yeah oh and of course photos so you know this is a great age of photography um where we've got these amazing photos these sort of really old school in, sort of emulsion print things um on glass glass slides and there's a real art um, apparently there's a real real art to doing that type of photography well and and apparently it's even harder in snowscapes where everything's white <laughs> I bet. it's really really apparently it's really mm. really hard to sort of make a good image and yet both on the Scott and Shackleton expeditions, they had sort of geniuses at it because we do have some amazing pictures. Um, yeah, it was um, uh, Frank Hurley, what I think was on Shackleton, and then is it Pon Henry Ponting, which on on the Scott exposition? I think that's right. Yeah, is it? Pon Let me just double check. Henry Ponting, because he was one of the few on on uh, Scott's expedition who wasn't that's right, Henry Ponting wasn't particularly interested in anyone else's job. <laughs> everyone That's else hilarious. was chipping in and learning everyone else's little thing you know really? over the dark months why not <laughs> but but the artist guy was just he not interested want anyone... in anything yeah he just wanted That's to do his drawing and nothing else and he, he took some um, cracking yeah. shots so obviously the really iconic one of the dog with the gramophone uh they're paying the music mm -hmm. to this penguin so henry Henry Ponting, yeah. Well, and also Frank Hurley on the endurance exhibition ex <laughs> exp expedition. Um, he actually dived down when the ship was sinking to to collect the glass slides, else they'd be lost to us. So he was a he was right in there. You know, he got right in that right in that water whilst it was touch and go. So we were very lucky to have them, but they were sort of like precious jewels to them and i'm very grateful we have them of course but yeah, extremely precious i mean it's kind of like getting those pictures back from the like, apollo landing party yes yeah uh, from the moon it's like they are gold dust this it's, it's amazing brilliant um, they really uh, are yeah um, but yes yeah, so i suppose scott you know they get to the they get, they get to the pole and they've they've lost the race <laughs> and they need mm. to get back and um so when the next spring the uh, relieving parties get up onto that higher plateau and they get to one ton depot which was the last depot scott failed to get to he was only like 11 miles from it um when they finally find them they find a tent with um scott uh wilson and bowers in it dead of cold oh god um, been, been dead for uh, I don't know how long it was, weeks or months or whatever, they're, they're dead. And they find the journals on them. They find out exactly what happened pretty quickly. But that's three. Five guys went out for the poll. <laughs> and, and there's only three in this tent. Like, what the hell else Jeez. happened? You know. Um, and so I suppose the Scott story is kind of a little bit bigger in some respects than just mm. uh, 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 an adventure on the ice. It does, <clears throat> you know, it does sort of touch upon uh, some kind of deeper, a little bit darker themes, like uh, how do you deal with defeat, you know, like a profound defeat, when, when you lose something you can't replace or you, you try your very, very hardest at something mm. and fail. Um, and even beyond that, how, how do you deal with death? How do you react? How do you um, conduct yourself in the face of death? Yeah, okay, that, well, I mean, I mean that's, quite, that's quite a dark theme, isn't it? Absolutely. Sorry. Even pragmatically, I mean, what do they do with the bodies? How do you sit next to that and write your journal? It's like, what? You're completely right. It's quite mortifying in many ways. And as heroic as these stories are, they are actually very um, dark in places, for sure. Mm. Mm. Well, on their way back, it, it just it just kind of gets darker and darker and darker, almost uh, uh, not the light, although the light isn't great, but it gets darker and darker and darker mm. in the sense of um, <clears throat> just almost each entry. It's like, oh, another thing has gone against us. Um, 
and well first of all Evans Edgar Evans who at first was one of the strongest probably one of him and and Bowers are probably the two strongest guys that that uh, Scott had but Edgar Evans seems to have um well they think maybe out of sight he fell down and smashed his head at one point Ooh. um but, but but they're not sure he definitely sort of damaged his hip in some way uh, you know walking through these crevasse fields apparently you take uh you, you fall over all the time um and so maybe he took a hit to his head but something happened with him where <clears throat> pardon me um he started getting frostbite and started getting delirious and, and at one point he sort of falls behind their party one morning and they stop for um lunch and he's like an hour behind um and then he sort of doesn't turn up he doesn't just keep coming so they they're alarmed and they go back to see him and they find him sort of delirious on the ice and he's opened his his top his smock he sort of opened it to the air and he's sort of semi he's sort of delirious and they're like what's what's going on what's the matter and he can't really explain himself he doesn't really know what happened um and really? he sort of he starts sort of swimming in and out of consciousness a bit I mean, this is hypothermia. He's got. I was going to say, it, it, would he be feeling hot at this point? Yeah, though? this is the, what what's happening. Actually, is he's in the very, very uh, extreme outer limits of suffering from <laughs> hypothermia. Oh, he's dying oh my of hypothermia. Yeah. Um, and anyway, he dies within uh, an hour or two of that, regardless of anything they can do. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, well, they they leave the body there. They have. That's to. harrowing, isn't it? Yeah they have to there's no there's nothing else they could do of course no. um and it's actually helps them you know scott says this it's horrible to admit but it's just the truth um, it really helps them because it's what one less well it doesn't help them manhaul their sledges uh but it helps them because he was holding them back and because there's now less food to have to cook uh, to heat every day apparently that's a massive thing it takes ages to yeah, heat up your food and heat up the tent a bit and one extra person all the calculations have to change. And so anyway, one less guy with them actually helps them a bit. But of course, it's really sad that they have to just abandon his body, which is found in the next season. And, and I was going to say, was the body ever retrieved? I assume so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so now they're down to four and uh, they've got to get, they're still trying to get back. And it just gets, let's say, it just gets more and more sort of desperate and harrowing until they, they start reaching these depots and the depots haven't got enough oil apart from food. They haven't got enough oil. And just oh. <laughs> they think now because all this has been poured over endlessly by historians. Every tiny little detail you can think of has been <laughs> discussed and looked at. And they think now that the containers that kept this oil in um, had like a, a leather cap or a leather stopper or something like that. that whatever capped these oil tins, these oil cans, wasn't a perfect seal. And so it would sort of evaporate. This oil would sort of evaporate, even if the can wasn't seemingly damaged or anything. So anyway, I mean, really? one parallel to the Franklin expedition, they had some cans that I think were, mm. uh, there was too much lead content in the cans. And they gave themselves lead poisoning without realising things like this. Um, so anyway, there's not enough oil. The, up, the upshot is, the net result of it is, is that there's not enough oil in these depots for, for Scott and his team to get back that they realize oh. i mean that's just ultimately in these what depots, does who, that and the weather. Silly, silly question but who, who stocks these depots are they left by former polar teams or this is what by them earlier like the year before and earlier in that year oh that that's that's who stocks them is it or yeah, these are things yeah. they, they right like i see but there wasn't enough oil yeah yeah Yikes. So, so for example, to maybe give it some context. They they head out in a team of eight, mm -hmm. and eight of them go sort of high up the uh, the Beardmore, and then and then they break off into five, and that five make the final few hundred mile dash to the pole, and uh, three headed back. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's mm -hmm. it works like that. But these depots they built and supplied them themselves. Yeah, they did. Scott did the, all the calculations himself mm -hmm. uh, himself, but. It didn't quite work. And anyway, that as a combo and with the combination that this uh, kind of unseasonal blizzard comes in, um, which really, really doesn't help. They're, they're, they're suffering sort of minus 30, minus 40 degrees when it sh and, and sort of 50 mile an hour winds when it shouldn't be that for that time of year. They sort of get a little bit unlucky there. 
So the combination of these depots not being supplied properly and a, a sort of unseasonal blizzards is the combination of those two things that really spells their doom. Mm -hmm. But I suppose there's the there's the story of oats. So they're down to four. So there's uh, uh, there's Scott Oats and uh, uh, and the other two. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, Bowers and Wilson, and okay. um, and Oates gets frostbite now in one of his feet, or both his feet actually, but one worse than the other, and in his hands in the end. Now, when you're in extremely terribly remote places, if you get sort of properly injured, you know, like some sort of real injury, um, you're in a bad place. <laughs> Uh, Scott called it uh, that he was on Queer Street. I don't know if that's really PC. You can say that anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> an old-fashioned thing. Mm. Yeah, so there's that story. Is it um, Beyond the Void? I oh, was it Touching the Void? Or that's right, it, yes. Um, yeah, that's amazing. It's like a documentary. I think it's yeah, like Touching yeah, the Void. Yeah, those guys were Touching the Void. That's it. Well, you know, if, if he, the guy shatters his knee um, almost at the, at the peak of a high Andean mountain, doesn't he? That's that yes, story. that's right. That's right. Yeah, and that's um, and he sort of he's got that song in his head, doesn't he? The whole way down. Yeah, yeah. That's that's an incredible story. That story, it, isn't it? It's really worth a watch. That. Um, um, but no, the point is, if you're somewhere where uh, you can't, no, there's no rescue coming. It's not possible for any sort of rescue mm -hmm. or really any help at all. If you can't get yourself out of that physical place on the earth, you're you're dead. Um, and and they they all they all knew it um, that the Oates's frostbitten feet uh, was you know a real a real bad problem um, yeah and so yeah we get into those sort of final kind of uh, heartbreaking passages of them having to deal with it um, and of course you know it's mm. you, you know it's it's not pleasant um, at one point he says what does he say um, this is uh, Scott, he says, uh, we mean to see the game through uh, with the proper spirit, which is very stoic, mm -hmm. isn't it? Or talking of Oates, he says, um, we still talk of things we'll do when we get home and just leaves it at that. You know, um, there's one entry where that's just the last line. Uh, but of course, that speaks of a whole deeper thing going on, doesn't it? Um, we still talk of things we'll do when we get home. Yes, of course. Um, yeah. He says, of again, of Oates, uh, he has a rare pluck, uh, uh, but he knows he has no way through. Mm -hmm. um, one, of the, one of the saddest things, I think, is at one point, just a few days before he dies, um, it says, Scott says that, that Oates uh, practically asked them for advice about what to do. Now, again, just that one line, but it, you can only imagine the real reality of that, like a guy saying... What do you want me to do? Do you want, do you want to leave me? Do you want to oh, get into the cold? Well, how do you say that? At one point, he does mention they've got opium or morphine or something. Yeah. So you could OD. I think they had like 13 opium tablets each or something weird like that. Um, so anyway, the, it's just the extremes of the human experience, isn't it? What, what, do, you do, what do you do with that? Um, of course. It, because it's not just, I mean, Scott says at this point, even if um, oats had disappeared, the other three of them are still in terribly, terribly dire straits. They're probably going to die anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. They sort of know that, more or less. And he says, quote, we must fight it out to the last biscuit. <laughs> um, which, again, I suppose is fight very stoic, isn't biscuit. it? Um, How far, am I right in thinking they're not even that far from the final... Obviously, they're in a bad condition, but was it 20 kilometres, the last leg or something, that they're... That far yeah, away? Well, I think they're about, I think it's about 11, I can't remember if it's miles oh. or kilometres. I think they're about 11 miles from a, a depot called oh. One Ton Depot. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think that's, I think there's two more depots between there and their base camp, which is, yeah. you know, a massive hut full of provisions and food and men to help them. So if they ever made it there, they would have survived. If they got to One Ton Depot, um, assuming there was enough oil and food there, which I'm not sure there would have been, um, that they may well have survived. And he was only 11 miles from One Ton Depot, which doesn't sound like much, but as I said earlier, um, trying to set up a, a, yeah, a, a narrative, <laughs> actually trying to tell a story. As I said earlier, there's that thing, when the weather comes down, you can't see your hand in front of your face. 
Okay, you're going nowhere. You can't just attempt to just walk in the right direction and hope that you'll you, you'll hit where you need to go. You can't do it. It doesn't work like that. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, you'll freeze. Your tonton will freeze before you hit the first marker. Um, you can't just walk out into into a blizzard. Um, and so that's sort of sort of what happens. Um, it's the combination of the the wind, uh, sorry, the weather and um, and uh, and these depots. If I've got one other quote, if that's all right, I please, yeah, please it's, do. It's reasonably long, but it's it's the passage in Scott's journal, which deals with oats. Sort of, I suppose that's the most famous thing, isn't it? Oats. Uh, uh, of course, uh, absolutely. Yes, it is iconic, yeah, isn't it? Uh, yeah, the iconic thing. Um, well, anyway, this is what he says. Um, uh, he, he actually starts this entry by saying he's not sure which day it is, which is very unscot. Um, uh, Scott is being very unscot right there. Um, is this, this is his you know, one, is near it the last end. entry? Sorry? This is his last entry, is it? Sorry? It's not the very last entry, no. no. Um, they go on to, the other three go on to live for a few more days or a week <laughs> or something. Right. But he says this, um, quote, uh, tragedy all along the line. At lunch the day before yesterday, poor Titus Oates said he couldn't go on. He proposed we should leave him in his sleeping bag. That we could not do and induced him to come on the afternoon march. In spite of its awful nature for him, because his, his feet are in agony with frostbite, um, in spite of its awful nature for him, he struggled on and we made a few miles. At night he was worse and we knew the end had come. Should this be found, i.e. the journal, um, should this be found, I want these facts recorded. Oates's last thoughts were of his mother, but immediately before he took pride in thinking his regiment would be pleased with the bold way in which he met his death. We can testify to his bravery. He, he had borne intense suffering for weeks without complaint, and to the very last he was able and willing to discuss outside subjects. He did not, would not, give up hope to the very last. He was a brave soul. This was the end. He slept through the night before last, hoping not to wake, but he woke in the morning yesterday. It was, it was blowing a blizzard. He said, I'm just going outside and maybe some time. He went out into the blizzard and we have not seen him since. I take this opportunity of saying that we have stuck to our sick companions to the last. In case of Edgar Evans, when absolutely out of food and he lay insensible, the safety of the remainder seemed to demand his abandonment. But Providence mercifully removed him at this critical moment. He died a natural death and we did not leave him until two hours after his death. We knew that poor Oates was walking to his death, but though we tried to dissuade him, we knew it was the act of a brave man and an English gentleman. We all hoped to meet the end with a similar spirit and assuredly the end is not far. End quote. Which well, is a bit, bit heartbreaking, isn't it? <laughs> and it goes, a hell of a thing to do, yeah. And uh, as we said earlier, the whole sort of eyes of the, of the British nation was sort of looking on, of hoping for the best, hoping for great news yes. <laughs> with, that we'd won this race. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the next year or whenever the news gets back, um, they realise it's like this <laughs> terrible mm -hmm. tragedy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's... that's how, how, long after, how long after did it take for people, how long would it have taken for the news to spread? Oh, I'm not sure exactly, but, you know, not quick. We're talking 1911. Um, mm -hmm. So I think they they would have found them s relatively soon after. But then how quickly the news gets back from Antarctica to, I suppose, New Zealand? I, I don't know, actually. I don't know the details of that, I must admit. I suppose once it gets to New Zealand, though, you can do... Mm -hmm. uh, they've got... Um, They've got the wire at that point, haven't they? In 1911, yeah. you can send you can send messages relatively quickly. Uh, but yeah, no, people wouldn't have known what the the, the fate of Scott for a while. Um, mm. But but yeah, so that's sort of I suppose that is the story, and they, they he's gone down as um, well, like a, a tragic hero, isn't it? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, and for a long time, I think even more so than Shackleton, I think Shackleton was quite a bit later, the interest in him uh, emerged. But that, it's a beautiful story and, and you've told it very well. Um, History, but I'm going to have to go, I've got to take a, a bathroom break very, very quickly. Do you think okay. you can hold the fort with another quote or so? 
Uh, yeah, I, sure. Is, am I putting you on the spot? I'm just no, no, asking something. Fine. All right. Okay. I, I'll run. Be very, very quick. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I guess I've got to hold the fork down. I can't see the chat, so I would probably try and interact with the chat, but I can't see it at all. So I'm just flying blind here. Um, <laughs> I suppose we were going to talk next bit. We're going to talk all about Shackleton, Ernest Shackleton, um, and his expedition after. So this great prize of the pole has, has, has gone. Amundsen's won that. So Shackleton decides the next thing is to, uh, the next goal is to cross the Antarctic uh, peninsula or uh, continental landmass entirely from one side to the other. So that's sort of the task he sets himself. And there's a great TV adaptation was made with, um, who was it, Branner, Kenneth Branner, uh, plays Shackleton uh, a few years ago, a fair few years ago, I don't know, 10 years ago or something now. Um, and that that is really good. I think that's excellent. Um, I think Branner actually does look a bit like Shackleton. I think there's actually a similarity there. <laughs> um, but what happens in the in this Shackleton expedition is it very, very quickly becomes a case of uh, escape and survival. Um, it's no longer uh, trying to cross the Antarctic. They don't really get anywhere near that. <laughs> um, it becomes, I suppose, a bit like... Um, uh, very tiny bit like Bravo to Zero. There's not much of the actual mission. All of the story really is how you get out alive. That's like the main, that's like the interesting bit really is if or how anyone makes it out alive. Um, so, so that's the story we're, we're looking at. Uh, it's a bit different to, a bit different to Scott's party, whole different story really. Um, so yeah, I mean, I could, I could just, start going into it but I don't want to tread on DOA's toes <laughs> we said when we was putting this together I would sort of do an overview and then talk all about Scott um and then she would talk all about Shackleton because Shackleton wrote a book all about it just called South um it's got an exclamation mark on it so it's South um and it's a <laughs> it's really good memoir um because he goes on so many adventures I mean it's kind it's one of those stories kind of unbelievable I mean again I do believe it I don't think anyone's lying or anything but um the odds of the things that happen that go on are just so so against the odds that it's uh well remarkable puts it puts it mildly hello hello yeah, hello. hello thank you ever so much I'm really grateful for that I just couldn't it was one of those emergency moments did you have a good wee <laughs> bathroom bathroom stop okay just powdering my nose <laughs> So I was just uh, waffling on in general terms about Shackleton, I like, I like Shackleton's, um, Shackleton's adventure. So do you want to maybe pick that up if you've, if you've been reading mm. South? It's a, it's a ripping have. yarn, isn't it? Don't you think? It's a, it's a proper ripper. Well, I actually received the book for Christmas from my dad. And it's not a book I would have chosen for myself. Uh, but I must say, I've been absolutely glued to it. And I, um, I only picked it up properly last month or so. But I've, I've really been hooked uh, utterly and completely. And I think it's because it's really precisely what I'd have loved as a girl. It's full of adventure and all the stuff that, you know, childhood wonder is made of. Um, I, in fact, it's hard to, it's hard, I was thinking, it's hard to know what to say about the story that hasn't been said a thousand times before. I was thinking before I came on, what can I say about Ernest Shackleton that's original? Uh, you know, that it's a story of bravery and leadership, endurance, and friendship and survival. And all of that is absolutely true. And I know it's, it's a bit of a boomer assessment of me, but honestly, I must say it really is just a very compelling tale. Um, yeah, I wouldn't worry about that so much. Just assume people don't know the story at all. I mean, we'll go in there then. Absolutely. <laughs> but I mean, you've, I assume you've, you you must be you've got South. Have you read South? Yeah, 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 yeah. I listened to most of the audio book for this. Yarn. And um, yeah, no, it, mm. it, I think it's really good. And Shackleton's style of writing is um, a bit more florid, maybe than yes. Scott. I mean, Scott's were really journals, literally journals. They, it was never meant to be a, a, a book as such. It might have just been notes that he might have later written a book. Whereas yes. South is um, <laughs> like an actual uh, piece of literature more, isn't it? So It um, is. Uh, I think that's why I why I liked it so much, and it is. I mean, it's still quite matter of fact in places, um, but yeah. So obviously, the story the story of Shackleton, of course, begins with that iconic advertisement that we've all seen: "Men wanted for hazardous journey, 
small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful. Honour and recognition in event of success. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is some question as to how authentic the wording is of that advertisement, but there was one placed and the job was an expedition to the South Pole. So Amundsen had notoriously made it first. So now the race was on to cross it in its entirety. Um, so I, what I like is you can see the real keen hunger of these men. They're just itching this appetite to get on to, to the next great, you know, to be the first. So I think over 5,000 odd men applied for the job and they could only choose 28. Uh, one thing that was very interesting about Shackleton's recruitment process, he actually went for the least experienced men in many ways. So he he tended to ask, he was interested in what they called the culture on board ship. So he would ask them, for instance, how well the man could sing, or he asked them in, in the interview process to deliver them a joke. So we tend to assume men like Shackleton are made of these hardy, stern metal, which which they are. But uh, it, these more social characteristics, whether or not you're a good laugh to have around, you know, whether you can spin a good yarn in, in these long hours of boredom, I always thought it was quite an interesting leadership style. So the goal, yeah, no, oh, sorry. I mean, you, you're looking for guys that you might have to be in a tent or a small cabin with for yeah. months on end. Um, so that's like quite a specific uh, uh, set of uh, characteristics you want in someone. Um, it, yeah, it could be the different, you know, it could be a really vital difference, let's say guys losing their mind and stuff. So, yeah, you need the right, uh, the right personality for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And and so that's what he looked for, um, which I always thought was quite interesting. You know, it wasn't necessarily the strongest, but uh, also willing to give the younger fellows a chance um, to be the firsts as well. So he had a really good mix on board. So um, the idea, the goal of the trip, of course, is to cross cross now the Antarctic. Um, two ships they set out with. Obviously, it was the Aurora and then, of course, iconically, the Endurance which Shackleton was on board. And the idea was that they would land on opposite sides of the sort of ice point, so one south, one north, and they would cross laying down these depots and meeting sort of somewhere in the middle. And the Aurora made it fairly safely, a couple of hiccups on the way. But of course the Endurance, very famously, had a wee bit more difficulty. So the ship essentially gets stuck in, as we have formerly referred to in pack ice so really dense ice and it, uh, uh, this is to the point where it's literally starting to concertina the ship it's crushing it so uh, for for many months or weeks and weeks but ultimately months they're basically trying to wait it out because the ice is very unpredictable so uh, these cracks are appearing and the men are around the ship trying to free the rudder. You see these pictures with the pickaxes and they're going at it with shovels, always constantly trying to free her up. And, you know, she she does manage to move through the ice um, here and there a couple of miles. But ultimately, it, it really succumbs. And as I say, it's all photographed by um, Frank Hurley. If people are interested, you can see the ship, um, you know, the ship is just completely uh, surrounded in this incredible ice. And it... it huge blocks of it essentially as I say they, they start to crush it and pancake it so yeah she's totally endure. this is obviously completely unexpected um so obviously Shackleton's journey is completely cut short and and this is a, a whole new none of this was obviously anticipated which took me a while. I didn't realise, I always thought that, uh, <laughs> I never necessarily realised that the journey he took was not one that he had planned in my ignorance. Hang on, I'm just trying to find it. There are plenty of, there are plenty of photos, got to find the perfect one. Yeah, I suppose one thing I'll quickly say while, you, while you're looking that up um, mm -hmm. would just be that um, it's actually not uh, weird or extreme what happened to the Endurance. I, I think, if anything, earlier expeditions were lucky that didn't happen to them. So, for example, on the um, on the Scott one, his ship gets caught in the pack a number of times, but they're just sort of luckily enough able to sort of get through or get out. Or at one point, they're sort of trapped in the ice, like the Endurance, for for ages. They go out on the ice and go skiing and play football while their ship is trapped, but is it's kind of luckily, I suppose, is able to get out and mm. doesn't suffer what happens to the Endurance. And at one point, actually, in Scott's journals, he says... I, I don't think the, the ice would ever crush the ship. I don't think, 
I don't think that's sort of possible. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> so, which is obviously a funny, not funny, ha ha, but a, a funny, interesting line uh, because it's so possible. <laughs> it's really, really possible, it, which is sort of, as you say, what happens to the insurance if you've got a picture of it. Here we are. All right, hang on. So, oh, huh. so that's that's the kind of you know how dense the ice was, and uh, you know this is her sort of trapped. Uh, you see the dogs there, but he, he, here it is essentially when it's all crushed up, and you, you know, you've got this guy with his pipe in his mouth surveying it, and it mm. did take a long time to get to that point. You know, they they thought it would free up because they were still living on board. They called the decks, they called it the Ritz, um, and here they are shoveling away with the. Uh, pickaxes and, and shovels and whatnot but ultimately you know she can she just completely breaks up and they, they they basically so everything on board of the ship they've got to try and um you get get off and so so gradually they're moving all the the stuff on board out onto the ice um so hang on let me just find the next bit well, so that's the thing they're not moving all their store they're, that's mm. their home that's their base and their home that ship yes so to lose yes. it is a terrible blow and they've got to move all their stores as much as they possibly can out of it but they, they move it onto pack ice they're not on land no. they're on like a few feet thick ice and underneath them is the antarctic ocean and, and so that's it's drift, very perilous drifting thing. as well. It's Sorry. drifting. It's drifting too. So there's mm. no way of anticipating what direction they're going to be going in, or no way of controlling it, at least. Um, yeah. So they get their couple of uh, lifeboats or three. Is it? I think three lifeboats. There's three initially, and they end up with two. And very famously, the the one I remember is the James Caird, which later on will become important. Um, so, so uh, this is this is just one of his quotes. So, obviously, Shackleton's heartbroken, and this is what he says: "At midnight, I was pacing the ice, listening to the grinding flow and to the groans and crashes that told of the death agony of the endurance. All night long, the electric light gleamed from the stern of the dying endurance. Hussey had left this light switched on when he took a last observation, and like a lamp in a cottage window." It braved the night until in the early morning the endurance received a particularly violent squeeze. There was a sound of rending beams and the light disappeared. The connection had been cut. I thought that was quite moving. Mm. Um, so so that their ship is gone now. So it's you know, things have gone a bit uh, a bit tits up, really. Yeah, big time. I mean, it's like, okay, it it's over. <laughs> The whole thing of going to Antarctica and walking across it and doing this and that, it's all over. That's done with. Now it's, is anybody in this party going to survive? Because we're on, we're, we're on the Antarctic pack ice mm -hmm. with these tiny ships. I don't know if you can, if there's any pictures of those, um, those launches or those, uh, 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 what they called, um, lifeboats. Um, yeah, they're right. just like an open rowboat. I mean, a big, a big rowboat, but not yeah. much more than that. So it, it is. It's, it's almost genuinely a rowboat, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's just like a big, big rowboat. Um, so at first they're towing them. They're kind of tugging them along, full of manhauling. Uh, yeah, yeah. Man, that's it, manhauling. And I think at one point they use the the, the James uh, cared as a tent, sleeping under it. So it's, it's pretty beaten up. Uh, it's a good job they took it there, of course. And as I say, Frank Hurley dived down to get the the glass slides, the photograph, the photographs. That's right. So as the endurance, its last moments, as it's crushed under mm. the ice and goes down, literally just go completely under the ice and is gone. In the last sort of moments of that, they save the all the pictures they'd taken earlier, which is well brilliant, isn't it? I mean, I, I mentioned yeah. when you did pop to the toilet that there's the Kenneth Branagh um, yes. uh, TV thing, and they show that that bit don't they in that mm -hmm. where he goes back and dives into the icy water um you know very close to being sucked down himself that's um, right but, but we're left with some of these incredible images aren't we well we've already shown a few they, they really are incredible and um yeah I, I think he said men on board you can you know take photographs but leave leave your sovereigns but take your photographs <laughs> yeah um, it kind of says it all doesn't it? i don't what's know if the in, i don't know if the endurance has been retrieved i assume people have gone back and trying to find bits and pieces on board, I don't know. 
sort of what like gone down and tried to find yeah the, subsequently uh, tried to find I, it i don't know about that actually that's I'm interesting sure probably tried, i probably um, would, would have heard about it if they'd had i don't hmm, know i've I actually know. it's funny i have watched quite a few half a dozen different documentaries about you know when they go down and look at the the titanic or yes. the Lusitania or or was actually there was one all about um the the, the franklin exhibition one of the cause there was two ships in that and they found one of those fairly recently like within the last handful of years interesting and uh yeah but i've never heard about them um yeah finding the endurance or you know divers going down and and stuff but that would be interesting if that did ever, ever happen it was. i wonder how they yeah. i wonder how difficult they'd find it but yeah i don't know um, I, I, again i think that part of the world is as inhospitable and as difficult as it's possible even now obviously mm. and constantly yeah. moving yeah 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 like the pack ice is this sort of monstrous thing the forces involved are just absolutely off the charts you know yeah millions and millions of tons the irresistible forces <laughs> so no wonder yeah. the, the, the wooden endurance was crushed to bits <laughs> yeah but it, it i mean i was surprised by how long it took um but yes it, it didn't ultimately it succumbed of course i think the uh, ice you know uh, closes in around it and then sort of pushed it up mainly mainly sort of i think pushed it up a bit so it wasn't just immediately pancaked it was sort of mm. raised up a bit but then it, it did sort of trap the, the bottom of its hull and there was just you know no, no real way as as you saw they would try to just um dig it out if it, if that's even possible if the men could sort of dig around it to give yeah. it a, any sort of leeway but it's just it's, it's impossible you know that the pack ice moves whenever and however it wants to <laughs> so yeah they lose that thing and so now it's just can't these three rowboats they've got all their stuff in it and um, and that's that they're all on the and, so 28 um, men and they're 56 dogs and this is this is another thing of course shackleton says you know if the party had not numbered more than six people and we the solution would not have been as hard to find, but obviously the transportation of the whole party really to a safe place um, made made the means of at his disposal quite limited, and it was going to be he was worried already a matter of quite extreme difficulty. And of course, again, I don't think it's a plot spoiler, but all twenty eight men survived, which is incredible, really incredible. Um, go on. Uh, well, no, yeah, exactly. That is the takeaway from it that somehow against the odds incredible odds we haven't even really described what they're up against particularly at this point mm. um i mean they're staring death in the face almost certainly and they must have thought that um yes and and none of them die so the story is you know <laughs> what what an incredible story of um endurance well it's funny that the chip is called endurance they go yeah through, it really uh, is the biggest test of endurance ever and a psychological one as well as physical um, so, so, so yeah, what they're up against is they're on this pack ice in the Ant Antarctic Ocean, and they start manhauling these ships, which is, you know, the boats, sorry, mm. um, which is sort of crazy enough as it is. And at some point, um, the pack ice starts sort of breaking up, literally breaking up under their feet, doesn't it? Yeah, this happens several times. Um, uh, just a giant crack will appear, and... Uh you know really and and, and, don't, and keep in mind i mean the surface of, is obviously snow which can be quite slushy so it, it's difficult to walk in that it's like walking through sand it's really dense i think at one point they decide to actually to walk at night because it's slightly cooler and therefore the, the, the snow would be firmer to walk on but they never can anticipate how deep it will be it's thinner in some places a couple of times people fell through and they managed to pull them out but yeah, the, these cracks will just, I think they refer to it as like floating on a, an iced wedding cake that's constantly being broken into pieces. Um, so they've got the wind, the, the charging flows, the heavy swell, all tugging it and all liable at any time to break them up and fling them into the sea. Yeah, like there's one bit I remember um, where one guy's asleep in his uh, sort of, you know, Arctic sleeping bag on the mm. ice. And a crack sort of opens up directly under him while he's yeah. asleep. Well, it, it wakes him up, of course. And, you know, what a sort of a terrifying thing that would be. Or, or at some point, they, they, I think, I can't remember what the rationale is, but they don't want to get in their boats until they have to, sort of the last minute. And so at one point they find themselves on um, just like this fairly big, I don't know, I think they describe roughly, very roughly, sort of football-sized, sized football pitch 
sized triangular bit of ice mm. <laughs> but they're just floating in the ocean and they know soon enough you know within minutes of that day it's going to sort of disintegrate and break apart entirely and they've got oh to my get gosh the, <clears throat> and they've got to get in the, the, these sort of small rowboats and th they're in the middle of the antarctic ocean i mean and the uh, boots, the boots are a bit rough great, as well. Great sailors. Sorry, what was that? Sorry. The boots are a bit beat up as well. Um, you know, the I think yeah. whatever they, whatever a plug is apparently is missing in one of them, and uh, the carpenter has to take nails out of a few of the cargo boxes on Elephant Island when we get to that to restore yeah. it. Uh, McNish is McNish the That's carpenter. That's right. Yeah, McNish. Yeah. McNish. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, apparently he was just an absolute expert, wasn't he? He sort of saved their bacon, epic. essentially, and a number of times by... Him, him and Cook, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, well, apart from anything else, sort of converting these rowboat things into an ocean-going vessel that, that, they try and, that they try and put some sort of uh, covering or deck kind of thing on it. Mm -hmm. So you can sort of get out of the weather a little bit, to some degree, on them. And yeah, one of them they call the James Care, which I think uh, named after, I think that's, a, I don't know why I think this, I might be wrong about this detail, but I think that was one of their uh, uh, financial backers. Oh, uh, right. Oh, yes, it was. Or, or, yes, or that's right. There was right. a school that was called that that backed them, or it was an individual. One of the anyway. schools had a lot of money, yeah. That's it. That's and, the um, so the, this is actually the launching of the James Care later on at Elephant big, Island. That's and not, they're, they're not very big, are they? Bear in mind, that's going, at some point in the future, that's going across 800-odd miles of open gale and sea. They were so, I don't know how they survived. Uh, here's a picture of the men actually launching it. So the, the rest of the men stayed on the island and five of them went off. So it's, the, it's the roughest seas imaginable, isn't it? It's the, it's the roughest it's seas understatement, yeah. in the world. Um, so so when, the, the, when the pack ice breaks up, they, they get on there, don't they? And they, they try and... Um, Shackleton decides that their best shot is to try and head for Elephant Island. Isn't it? Yeah, well, if they did. They decide at first, I think, to to actually try for somewhere called Clarence Island, and then there's another one called Deception Island. But because they're, as I say, the the, the ice itself is floating, they they basically get it. They can see these islands, and they they pass by them. There's no way of landing. Um, so it's really unfortunate, but ultimately then to Elephant Island, it's sort of their last shot of all three, really. In fact, if they'd made it to Clarence Island, I think I'd read that they'd only have some 80 odd miles of water to go to a place called Prince George Island, where there was a station. Mm. But yeah, Elephant Island, and they were hoping there was, I don't know whether they thought there was a whaling station or they thought there was a depot that they could then get to a whaling station. But so, so that's what they do. And they, so they've crossed all this ice and it's to Elephant Island they're heading. And that Elephant Island and a lot of those island, other islands you mentioned there mm. are uh, really nothing more than a, a sea mount, really, just a bit of rock sticking out of the ocean. Um, you know, there's no vegetation on it. There's not really anything on it. It's completely bleak Pebbles. and barren. And yeah. Yeah, all you'll get there is sometimes um, uh, uh, seals uh, will sort of just lay on the beach, sunbathing on the beach. That's all that's there. I mean, quite yeah. literally, that's all that's there. So they get to Elephant Island and, um, well, it, you know, it's it's dry land. It's better than being lost in the Antarctic Ocean. It's better than walking across the pack ice aimlessly. But mm -hmm. but it's still, uh, you, you know, you're, you're nowhere near out of the woods because if you look at the map or something, these those islands down there, Elephant Island and the such, are... Just, just terribly remote. There's, yeah, like you said, there's no whaling station or anything no. down there. There's it's no just barren, totally it's, desolate. Yeah, it, yeah. They've only been mapped in the last few generations. Mm. Um, there's, there, there's not really. Well, there's no hope really of being picked up or rescued from there. That people might not go there for years and years and years. You know, there's no reason for anyone to go there. <laughs> um, so yeah. all the men, they're still all alive. He's got all alive, and um, they're on their elephant island. And um, so Shackleton has to make some sort of leadership decisions, doesn't he? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And the uh, I think the, the closest or the best chance they have is South Georgia Island, which is, I think, is 1,200 miles off the southernmost tip of South America. So another small island, but has a whaling station, um, they hope. And it does, but, you know, they're not entirely sure, but they hope. Um so really, this is their last chance of contacting a civilization. And the journey is going to be 820 miles in this ding dinky little boat. Uh, really rough open sea. 
I don't know how they managed it. I really don't. But they, you know, they he made that decision. Five of them went. Um, Shackleton, Worsley, Crean, McNeish, McCarthy and Vincent. Um, and as, as we've already said, they take the James Caird. It wasn't in the best of Nick. <laughs> uh, and, and the men, the men, the rest of them, they just have to wait. And they're wait, they wait for four months for him to return. They don't know if he's coming back or not. Yeah, so like that South Georgia island is a bit of a different prospect. It's a, you know, sort of a, a proper island with mountains on it and stuff. <laughs> it's like an yeah. actual decent landmass. You know, it's not just a bit of rock sticking out of the sea. I mean, no. I've probably, I've, I've, I've exaggerated that. You know, Elephant Island's a bit more than a rock sticking out of the sea, but not much. Whereas South yeah, Georgia is, is a proper, proper island, you know, with mountains on it and everything. And there's a, a permanent whaling station there. It's like a, a kind of a, a, yeah. a well-known haunt of whalers and had been for a long time. So they can expect that if they can make it to South Georgia, um, that they can expect that they're, they're, they're back to civilization to some degree. Mm. Um, but as you say, South Georgia is hundreds and hundreds of miles across the worst oceans in the world, <laughs> um, away from Elephant Island, and they've got, as, as people see, these, these, these this dinky little boat. So it's yeah. sort of a suicide mission. You, you can only imagine that that it was sort of heading out into into death. And it was. The chances of making it are extremely slim. Very slim, and the and the men on the island don't know, but it's their only hope because if they if Shackleton doesn't make it with his with the you know the four others, then they're buggered. They'll starve to death, and that will be their end. So they they, they gave three three cheers as it went off, and and that was that. <laughs> and then um, yeah, into the into the James cared. So obviously <clears throat> at this point, you know Shackleton isn't. Um, He's not really sat down with his pen and paper recording his diaries, so he he tends to he has to re recollect the memories on return. But he did scribble down a few notes at this point and very brief, and they read simply: "Cold, sore, anxious, no dry places in boat, flung to and fro by nature in the pride of her strength." I also said so they're quite powerful sentiments for this brief scribble. Mm, mm, and the mm. weather, constant gale, gigantic waves, and storm. I think they catch a glimpse of sunlight only maybe once. So the navigation, there's no navigation by sun or stars. So they had to navigate using something called dead reckoning, mm. which from mm. what I, I don't know much about, but I think I looked it up. Naval navigation is no maps, obviously, no GPS, mm. but I think they had a sextant, but obviously no sun, no stars. So I think sort of estimating distance using, I don't know. Maybe someone in the chat can explain. Maybe Ajit, I'm sure, will know. <laughs> but very impressive again. So, yeah. So that that um, feat of getting from Elephant Island to South Georgia mm. with with nothing other than a sextant is mm. considered uh, well, yeah, a, a great, an incredible, almost unique feat of navigation. Um, incredible. So, so what they had, they had those three um, little boats. And they take the James Cairn and, and do that with that. The other two, they turn upside down and use as sort of a makeshift shelter for the remaining guys left on Elephant Island. And as you say, they've just got to stay there. And uh, I mean, they're able to eke out their lives by, you can kill seals. You know, mm -hmm. a man can just walk up to a seal and club its head in. Um, that's quite easy. Um, <laughs> and you can, <laughs> so they're not actually terribly, terribly, um, you know, short of food. You, you no, can, they're eating, you can, they're eating raw blubber. Basically. Yeah, and, and you can use the blubber from a seal to cook with and, and, mm. and as, as heating and as light. They, they make uh, blubber stoves, that's what they call it. Um, and you can eat the blubber oh. and cook with it. Apparently it tastes gross, Ooh. but but you get used to it really quickly. And if it's a matter of survival, you don't really care in the end. Um, so food isn't a massive problem. They can eke out and, they, and they're there for months. And that's how they do it under these, these the, those other two boats that have turned upside down and crafted into some sort of shelter. But that's yeah, amazing. just that... that that voyage um, that Shackleton does, um, again, I, I've got to admit, I, I don't mind admitting, but I don't really understand who, how all that works. <laughs> like, so, for example, the, in the in the Scots uh, journals, he gives his position all the time. I read one out um, earlier, didn't I? Said at, at eighty-nine degrees, forty-two minutes south. Um, that's like you know your position. Um, I, I, I don't understand exactly how all those people go mad in the chat probably do understand it but um <laughs> you know i don't know how to use a sextant and a watch 
and figure well, out where I am in the world. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> well, you, but you there's a real skill with, to it. You Sorry, can't go with no you can't with no stars or sun, I don't think. Well, yeah, so, you, you use the sextant to look at the skies, yeah. So um, dead reckoning is basically Duke says it's basically an educated guesstimate. And um, someone else said it's like throwing a rope over the side to figure out your speed. So well, amazing. What, is, what, what you mentioned was that they were able to see, I can't remember if it was the moon or the sun. Or, or, or one of the important, yeah, they were able to just about glimpse them a couple of times in that whole journey. And I can't remember which one of them, it wasn't Shackleton himself, it was one of the other guys, but one of them who's sort of the sexton expert. Um, apparently it able, being able to take a reading um, when you just get a glimpse of it um, on a rocking sea, um, and, and really, really massive waves, uh, to get a, a good reading, apparently that's, the, the guy was a genius to be able to do it. Um, and uh, but they did and they they hit south georgia you know, they, you know they just incredibly it. against the odds massively against the odds they I did hit see they which hit one south of georgia. Them was the expert yeah they had they had a, a sextant sea anchor binoculars and a compass uh, oh, the, by the way, just incidentally, the other two boats were called, oh, the little boats were the Stan, the Stankham Wills and the Dudley Docker, just out of interest. Good names for dogs, I think. I always think it's funny, the Victorian names they, they give to stuff. Yeah. Was, um, there was one of the uh, ponies they talk about loads on the Scott expedition. They called him um, James Pig. <laughs> uh, I don't know why, I, I don't understand, Dang but it. it's just like that classic, just completely original Victorian thing you know they're just it's just a completely original thing they're not copying anyone they're just making some random new weird thing up out of left field and uh yeah they call it Jimmy Pig they get really attached Jimmy to, 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 to Jimmy Pig they're one of their strongest awesome. ponies <laughs> but um yeah. yeah the names they give to stuff and the nicknames for things it's all very quaint yeah some, some of the Shackleton's dogs were I think Slobbers, Ulysses, um Shergwin and uh, Slippery Elliot was one of the <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Pig. That's brilliant. It's so funny, um, quite often they give them names of the other actual humans that are on yes. the expedition as well. Like, in other words, this this horse looks a bit like you, mate. <laughs> That's basically yeah. what, what they're saying to each other. Isn't it? Pony. I don't know if I'd rather have the pony or the, or the dog. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so so Duke, thank you, Duke. Who says he. Dead reckoning, you take your last known position and you take account of the wind and tide and hope you're right. So they made it. They made it amazingly. And I, mm. I don't know if this is true or not, but I did read that the plug on the little boat basically became dislodged and it, the boat basically fell apart as soon as they landed. I don't know how much of that is romantic. I don't think it needs romantic embellishment, though, because it's mm. bad enough as it is. So, so yeah, there we go. I heard that, yeah, when they tried to land on South Georgia, it's, that, that's... That's not a straightforward thing, um, and they had to sort of sort of crash land it <laughs> into yeah, South it's still Georgia, icy, isn't essentially. It? Um, and uh, as I mentioned, South Georgia's a decent landmass; it's got sort of mountains on it, and they land on the wrong side of South Georgia, don't they? To That's where the whaling it. station is, and they need to get to this whaling station. There's after everything they've gone through. There's now this mountain range in their way. <laughs> yeah, they get they get to the wrong end, don't they? So. <laughs> I think they've got to do another sort of 36 hours of trekking, but which maybe doesn't sound a lot, but I mean, hell, they're hungry. They've come a long way. And the three of them are very ill. So I think it's just the two. No, it's three of them that go yeah, and two of them it. wait on the other side of the island. I'm oh, just on my phone. History break. There's someone, someone at my door. I think it's the postman. Do you think you can hold the fort just for two yeah, seconds? I can hold the fort, I'm ever so sorry. Worry. Two seconds. God, everything going off in DOA's world at the moment. <laughs> Telephone ringing and someone at the door. Um, so, yes, yeah, Shackleton and the, the band of five that hit South Georgia, um, yet yeah, they decide to split up. Two of them stay where they are because they're so exhausted, close to death, really. And Shackleton and two of the others head out across this mountain range. And, um, of course, they make it, but it's just one last final um, slap in the face, one last final ordeal that they have to go through. And when they do finally reach that whaling station, on South Georgia, they look like um, you, you, know, you know they're covered in rags. They're, they've got the, all these you know long straggly beards. You can imagine half frostbitten. They just look at a complete state, um, just um, wild men coming out of the 
coming out of the mounting range when no one come no one approaches the whaling station from that side from the mountain side how incredible and of course people knew that the Sh the shackleton party had been lost you know like years before two years before three years before something like that they left a few years ago <laughs> and um and when he comes back people can't believe it. it's like come back from the dead sort of you know um you are, are, you, are you there i'm back <laughs> so, was it the postman it was i would have left okay. it but he kept knocking so then he rang so <laughs> no, no i was just saying when they turn up out of the wilderness at, at that south georgia whaling station yes what, what, what a sight that must have been what an episode well, that is i've got the um the little exchange here um which is amazing so hang on where are we oh when he asks about the war that's it the first ah, yeah, thing yeah, he yeah, asks yeah, was brilliant, um because a few a few i think people may be wondering obviously you know they set out in 1914 isn't it and some people were sort of you know wondering why he wasn't in the war effort but they didn't know the war was going to start or how long it would be so the whole time they are concerned you read the, the book in, in south they're constantly concerned with what's going on with the men at home anxious to return to them yeah you know, obviously not really their fault that they got stuck out here on the ice but um the book the book south is also dedicated to i think it says my comrades who fell in the war so they're very self-conscious of that and so, so this is where him when they get to the whaling station, and I think I mentioned earlier that they they worry, they worry there might be a couple of women in there, so they you know oh, you might look a bit uncivilized. Um, so we, it says we came to the wharf where the man in charge, um, oh, man in charge stuck to his station. I asked him if the manager was in the house. Yes, he said as he stared at us. We would like to see him, said I. The man went towards the manager's house, and we followed him. I learned afterwards that he had said to the manager, there are three funny looking men outside who say they've come over the island and they know you. I've left them outside, a very necessary precaution from his point of view. The manager came out to the door and said, well, my name is Shackleton, I said. Immediately he put out his hand and said, come in, come in. Tell me, I said, when was the war over? The war is not over, he answered. Millions are being killed. Europe is mad. The world is mad. So that was the first thing he asked him. I always thought it was very touching. Yeah, and what a crazy thing. I mean, you know, is it in um, Jumanji and the Fast Show when it's like, what year is it? Who's the president? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I those things. Uh, it's like, um, yeah, he's coming out of the wilderness. And so the war kicked off just as Shackleton was leaving. I, mm. I think literally war was declared in the weeks before he left. And so he said to the Admiralty, to the Royal Navy, basically, like, if you need my ship, if you need our men, because all the most of the people are Royal Navy guys or ex Royal Navy guys, if if you need us for the war effort, we'll completely abandon our Antarctic expedition and put yeah. all, all, all of ourselves and our ship at your disposal. And the Admiralty, the word came down from up on high. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Um, they were and, very keen and, for them to go, weren't they? Yeah. Sorry? The, the admiralty were very keen for them to yeah, go weren't they yeah they said look you know we, we've got the, the the royal battle fleet uh we, we we don't need you go ahead we'd rather you do what you're supposed to do go ahead um and and, and of course the, the narrative was that the war will be over by christmas yes it's, all, it's, it's august 1914 it all kicks off the mm. guns of august and uh, people i think did think <clears throat> sort of normal people that would just believe the, the propaganda they were told it would be over by christmas um so <laughs> when shackleton that that moment in the south georgia he you can sort of expect that he might that you, you he might expect to hear that it was over by christmas or it's over within a year and somebody won mm. but it's actually what is it 1916 or 1917 at that point 16 so, I think. right so late 16 so what the guy told him is is of course true and uh, yeah i mean well it's just uh an, an incredible moment isn't it you can only imagine what they thought well I, I also wanted it so yes exactly and they are very um you know self-conscious of that he writes about it often and as, as i said the book is dedicated to that as well so that must have been a hell of a shock but i, I should also say there was i don't know if you mentioned this when i um <laughs> went to see the postman so to speak but uh, did you mention about the waterfall uh, no, I didn't. Was this on South Georgia? So this is on. This is another just like final little bit. So obviously they've mm. la they've landed on the wrong side of the island. So they're already like, oh, for, you know, all right. So they they 
you know, they're going through all this dense forestry and whatnot. So the last lap of the journey, literally they can see now down the steep mountainside, they can see, I, I don't know whether it's sails of, of the various boats, these whaling ships, I guess they would be masts and whatnot. And they look down and they realize they're at the top of a waterfall. So um, I'm just reading it here. Uh, it said the sole possible pathway seemed to be a channel cut by water running from the upland, blah, 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 blah. We were wet to the waist, shivering cold and tired. It was the splashing of a waterfall and we were at the wrong end. When we reached the top of this fall, we peered over cautiously and discovered that was a drop of 25 to 30 feet with impossible ice cliffs on both sides. To go up again was scarcely thinkable in our utterly wearied condition. The way down was through the waterfall itself. We made fast one end of our rope to a boulder with some difficulty due to the fact the rocks had been worn smooth by the running water. Then Worsley and I lowered Crean, who was the heaviest man, and they essentially just dropped down. Uh, they disappeared altogether. Falling water came out gasping at the bottom, sliding down the rope, um, which I thought was amazing. So they, so they just get there and they everywhere, like, ice mountain on either side. They can't go face going up. So they're like, right, we're going down the waterfall. And they do. I just thought it was amazing. Yeah, it's great. I think both the uh, Scott and Shackleton, their their their, uh, their most famous expeditions, they're both just absolutely chocked full of um, yeah. sort of Every daring page. do and uh, crazy stories. Yeah, Every it's great. Page. So much we've left out, sadly. But it is. Yeah, it's, it's, this is why I think, you know, I I did think, oh well, people will think I'm just rehashing tales of old heroic heroes. But I, I there is a reason these tales survive because every page it's just it's the kind of book, book or content i'd imagine a grandfather reads to his you know grandkids before bed and they dream of whales and storms and shipwrecks and things it's it's just amazing how that they survive i don't know how they did it well it's what they used to call boy's own stuff you know yes um, yes uh, exactly. just <laughs> when uh, boys would read about the adventures of like the boer war and things like that and, and 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 what what scott and shackleton did and that's sort of what you aspire mm. to you know being very very stoic this is the old stiff upper lip thing i mean absolutely shackleton's upper lip couldn't get any stiffer really no, <laughs> um, no. and it's great i mean i mean the story's mostly over but of course th they've reached this whaling station they've still got a get yeah. a, a, a rescue party back to the other side of georgia which is easier said than done and then get a, a ship back down to elephant island and rescue these guys that of course, I've got no idea that Shackleton made it. They're just living out their days know. in, you can imagine, complete despair <laughs> on Elephant Island. But Absolutely. eventually they get a uh, rescue ship. Is it from, um, well, I'm thinking Chile uh, or somewhere somewhere like that, Chile? Yes. Maybe a proper uh, country in South America gives them a, a good, decent boat uh, with, um, with a motor on it, I believe, some sort of steamer, something where they can get down to... Elephant Island as quickly as yes, possible. Yes, the head of the Chilean and Navy. That's it. Was the Chileans right? So, and it still yeah. takes them a couple of attempts. It's not easy. It's not just straightforward. Three. Another three, was it three? into the water right. So even yeah. that was a real chore, wasn't it? <laughs> but he was straight on it. Same day, boat out, and he he he, oh, yeah, he wasted that time. He was yeah. on it. He said, "Right, we have got to go and get the boys." So um, yeah, three attempts. They got them on the other side of the island, but none of them wanted the rest. They were straight back out. I'm just trying to find the fight photo. I think there's a photo of when the rescue boat arrives and they're all cheering. It's a very, uh, you know, can you imagine? Because I'm not being funny, but if it was four months, I'd probably think, yeah, they're, they're dead. They ain't coming back. But you there they were. Can you imagine the elation? Um, well, it's mm -hmm. a new lease of life, isn't it? It's sort of, you are just staring a very, very slow death in the face. Um, and suddenly... Um, the boss has come back to save you. Um, <clears throat> there's one story actually I like just of that last bit when they turn up to save the the, the last of the mm -hmm. company on Elephant Island is that they tried to uh, something like they tried to shoot a gun because uh, they couldn't immediately get to them because of the pack ice oh, and various okay. things. So they tried to shoot a gun to sort of let them know that they were there. Um, oh. But apparently when they did eventually find them and told them about their earlier attempts to rescue them, they said, we fired a gun. Didn't you hear us? And they, <laughs> said, and they said, no, that we hear um, the pack ice breaking up all the time. And that sounds like the boom of a cannon. That sounds like a gun quite often when the, when the ice cracks and breaks. Mm. And so we never heard any gunshot to us. It was just one more boom in the distance. 
Um, oh, but I thought that was a sort of just a kind of interesting little anecdote. <laughs> but yeah, he saves them all, and they all survive, don't they? And they all all them... survived, and I don't think they did too badly. A bit of frostbite and whatnot. Um, yeah, there was one guy that was was in pretty bad shape that I think didn't live all that long after. But still, the record is that he they, he, he saved them all. And I think one of the the sort of one of the saddest things is that a lot of them they're all sort of these young men that are mm. of fighting age so a lot of them go off and fight in world war one in yeah, the, straight back in, into in, it yeah in the last um year or so of world war one and loads of them get killed mm. oh that's just <laughs> in, dreadful, on it? the western front and uh and, and places uh, to my shame is, i don't know which uh, ones actually i'll have to look that up but yeah mm. quite a few of them died in in the war so they went through this kind of unbelievable mm. kind of ridiculous um adventure survived it and, and and then just get a bullet um on the western front which is well, absolutely yeah. dreadful yeah yeah i think and i wonder whether that's why in many ways the story the two stories you know did sort of become canonized in the imagination a tale of survival maybe i don't know um yeah, and, and of course, Scott and Shackleton are both sort of heroes, aren't they? They're heroic, oh, of um, course, yeah, but in very different ways, aren't they? I mean, Scott yeah. is is your classic, uh, you know, doomed hero, a martyr yeah. of a of a type. Yes, um, and and that's got its own, uh, you know, that's got its own thing that comes with it. This the whole baggage that comes with uh with dying <laughs> yeah. like john lennon or whatever <laughs> um and, and then but then you've got shackleton who um it, yeah his 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 heroism or his story is just a very different stripe isn't it that they all survived so you don't get that you don't get the martyrdom side of it um so yeah they're, they're just two very different types of hero um and uh, but of course he survived so there's sort of the very end of shackleton's life do you want to maybe say a word or two about about that <laughs> Well, um, yeah, a, a funny, one funny thing I read was that as soon as he returned to London, some some local geezer, you know, the, I guess they had a bit of a, I don't know, they had a bit of a do when they got back, welcomed them home and whatnot. Um, but some local lad, I think he meant it seriously. He said, oh, yeah, welcome home, Mr. Scott. I just thought that was quite funny. <laughs> um, yeah. And yeah, I, was, I, I, did you know the riposte to that? Apparently no. Shackleton said... Uh, Scott died bloody years ago or something like that. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you would, I suppose. Yeah. Fuming, fuming. Yeah. I also thought that was quite funny, though. But I want, I mean, I don't think Shackleton's legacy really became that immediately, as immediately popular as Scott. I, don't, I might be wrong, but I, I think it sort of revived interest in later years. But yeah, he was right back out there. He wanted to do another final one. He wanted to now circle the Antarctic. But unfortunately, he died, had a heart attack. Uh, not long after and, and sadly died but yeah he, he he was itching to get right back out can you imagine going through that yeah it's, it's crazy isn't it I mean I think um and then be like yeah let's go again yeah I think Shepperton suffered from the same thing I, I mentioned it in my the last of my Drake videos um sometimes people get completely addicted to a thing mm. kind of regardless of how old they get or how dangerous the thing is they just want to do that thing again or try it again. And it seems like, um, it, well, well, Drake and Shackleton both died out on, you know, in the far flung regions of where they sort of wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And they were sort of a, a, probably a bit too old or a bit too past it to be doing that still um, slightly. I mean, maybe that's a yeah. bit harsh. But Shackleton goes back down there in like 1921 or 1922 or something uh, for, for another expedition, just another expedition. But yeah, he just he just has a heart attack. <laughs> Yeah. And, and dies, doesn't he? Sort of very, very, very suddenly, sort of out of nowhere, kind of thing. And he's buried down there, I believe, in Antarctica, ah, which is kind of, you know, kind of fitting. Um, yeah. Um, sort of doing what he wanted to do, you mm. know. Um, so, so yeah, that 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 was his end. Well, there he he has another sort of wonderful finishing quote in South. I'll read you quickly, which is, um, oh no, sorry, this is just after they went down the waterfall. So he's, he talks about how they, they'd flung down basically, I think just the log book and the cooker wrapped in one of their shirts. And he said, that was all, except our wet clothes that we brought out of the Antarctic. That was all which we had entered a year and a half before, um, full of, with a well-found ship, full equipment and high hopes. That was all of tangible things, 
But in memories we were rich, we had pierced the veneer of outside things, we had suffered, starved and triumphed, groveled down yet grasped at glory, grown bigger in the bigness of the whole, we had seen God in his splendours, heard the text that nature renders. We had reached the naked soul of man, shivering with cold, yet with hearts light and happy, we set off towards the whaling station. And then we tried to straighten ourselves up a bit, for the thought that there might be women at the station made us painfully conscious of our uncivilised appearance. So that was quite a nice, uh, nice poetic bit. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's one of the only things, just looking at a couple of notes I've got here, I maybe wanted to do a few more details. <clears throat> I won't, obviously, but I'm just say a few more details about the Amundsen campaign. But the only other thing yeah. I really wanted to mention, really, which we haven't, was just that in both um, Scott's journals and South, um, there's quite a lot of passages about how beautiful it is, um, just about mm. uh, rainbows and double sunsets and uh, the, the emeralds and the saffrons and the golds and, and, and all the shadows. And um, yeah, th these aren't particularly romantic men, really. <laughs> these are very hard bitten uh, sailors for the most part. And yet they can't, they seem, seemingly can't really resist the urge to try and describe, or there's so many times when Scott says, words cannot describe all the blues <laughs> that yeah. you can see in certain bergs and stuff like that and they, they just wax lyrical about the, the, the beauty of it quite a lot um and uh, yeah we didn't really mention that but that is a big big part of it I think the, those are some of the most beautiful parts as well I mean I I saved a few on my kindle because they're just you talk you just, you say talking about the crimson and gold sunrise and uh, the rainbows I mean they must have seen some fabulous things um, but yes, it's, some of those actually are the most beautiful, and that's well worth reading the books for those descriptions. Mm -hmm. You know, the the snowflakes, and it, there's one bit that was really ASMR-y where he talks, of, he talks about the Burberry suits, which I assume is the brand that made the gear, crackling under the the frost and like the snowflakes on their lashes, and it's all, yeah, you get a real feeling of being there. For sure. Yeah, quite a lot of description about different types of, of snow and crystals and things yes. like that. I think Shackleton no, is a better think. read, if I'm going to be honest. Uh, I, I, well, I think, think the, I think the Scott one is more uh, technical. And if you're interested in Scott's story, mm. then it's just a, a real page turner. Brilliant, I think. But South is, I'd say, much more of a story. Like he uses a lot more um, like uh, uh, similes and metaphors and things. Like he took, doesn't he? Talks a lot about. Um, how it's that they're in a battle against nature um, yeah. and stuff. Whereas Scott is just like, this is the date, this is the temperature, this is what happened today. <laughs> whereas South is, there's, uh, it's a lot more, um, well, it's but more I like guess, a book, really. I suppose in that sense, though, you know, Scott at least was writing it organically. Uh, mm. I think Shackleton obviously had a bit of retrospective time to, uh, I don't think he embellished or lied about anything, I don't think, but yeah, maybe no. a bit more time to. No, it's just Scott's journals are exactly that. They're his journals. Mm. They weren't meant to be sort of the final product that a publisher would try and sell. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, they're completely different. They're completely, it's a completely different type of reportage, I suppose you could say. <laughs> I'm just trying to find, because before they left the endurance, they did, he, he ripped out a page from the Bible. Uh, yeah, he said it was... He, he, they picked up, uh, he ripped out, uh, the sovereigns were thrown away and the photographs were kept. I tore the flyleaf out of the Bible that Queen Alexandra had given to the ship with her own writing in it. And also that wonderful page of Job containing the verse, out of whose womb came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven who have gendered it. The waters are hid as with a stone and the face of the deep is frozen. So I thought that was very romantic mm -hmm. that he, he tore that out of the Bible as well, had that with him the whole way. Mm -hmm. I wonder where that is, actually. I wonder if it must be in a museum. Hmm. Let's look it up. Yeah, they are quite, um, I wouldn't say devout, but they're quite religious. Um, like mm. Scott has a Sunday service every Sunday. Mm. Um, they call it, He calls it divine service, <laughs> where they will have, they'll sing hymns and things. And they oh. like sort of, they do uh, recognise Easter and Christmas and stuff. Interesting. So, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think at one of the meal times when they were a bit low, low on food, they the, the the cook would sort of lift up spirits, as I say, by calling it the Ritz and whatnot, and uh, <laughs> the Ritz menu and things. <laughs> Quite funny. Yeah, no, it's great how they keep each other's spirits up. Uh, I mm. mean, again, it's testament to um, how people can survive in in um, terrible, terribly harrowing situations, <laughs> and you can, I can uh, do it. I'd perish keep calm and carry on. You know. 
<laughs> yeah, it really is. I must. I, I mean, I must say, I'd perish immediately. I'd be rubbish at it. I really would. So I, I'm very impressed by it. Um, well, we do have some questions. Oh, was there anything else you want? To, you want to say something about no, Amazon no. at all? Or? No, 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 no. That wasn't. That wasn't what I meant. No. Um, yeah. No. Any questions? If there are some. All sure. right. Let's have a little nose. What we've got. So Harmony Creek. Hello, my friend. He says, I know this is a history stream, but do you or your guest think that one day Antarctica will be populated by normal people, especially if global warming happens and much of the ice melts? I reckon there must be loads of natural resources there. What do you think? Uh, yeah, possibly, quite possibly. Um, Graham Hancock thinks so. Yeah, well, I mean, who knows? Um, I think, yeah, the climate would probably have to change significantly. Um, but yeah, why not? If it did, absolutely, why not? <laughs> I think Graham Hancock has says that you know that they've certainly found uh, evidence of a tropical rainforest right right underneath it before the ice age or whatever. I don't know. So there's yeah, that's right. They've there. taken they've taken core samples and it shows that there were forests there at some point. Yeah. Amazing, well, the, 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 the Earth's climate has been radically different, isn't it? I mean, like you know, in dinosaur mm. times. Um, <laughs> you know, tens or hundreds of millions of years. Dinosaur ago. times. Uh, I mean, well, we've had snowball earth haven't we where almost yeah. the entire earth has been sort of glaciated and all the all the earth's um oceans are frozen and then we've had uh we've had periods in dinosaur times when there was <laughs> there was no uh north pole no no, no uh, cats on the north pole at all mm. and they think maybe none on the south pole or very little certainly where you would have yeah, palm trees and ferns, no, on, palm on, trees. On, on the south pole yeah, That's certainly so ferns certainly ferns i think um but yeah like um uh, not tropical what is it sort of subtropical uh, forests mm -hmm. on, that's amazing the, yeah it's crazy isn't it yeah i wonder what else is down there it has been very very different in both directions to what it is today yeah i always find it amazing when these clumps of amber wash up on some of britain's beaches to think that they've come you know on the cold Baltic Sea tide have come from some from sap in the tree of some rainforest at the bottom of the <laughs> Baltic Sea. Just mad, mad, isn't it? Well, one of the things to put it in perspective is that, that people say there's not a single tree on An on Antarctica today nowadays. There's not a single tree, mm. and we're talking thousands of square kilometers. So, um, so yeah, well, yeah. What lies barren. beneath? What lies beneath? Graham Hancock. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, there we go. Uh, so, so not a piano key says happy and blessed Easter. Thank you very much, sir. And to you too. Alan B. Stard MP says, he says the long imagined but undiscovered South Polar continent was originally called Terra Australis and sometimes shortened to Australia as seen in a woodcut illustration titled Sphere of the Winds contained in an astrolo astrological textbook published in Frankfurt in 1545. In the early 19th century, the colonial authorities, he carries on to another one, thank you. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I read them the wrong way around. I'm ever so sorry. Uh, I'll start that again. Okay, Antarctica was originally, no, hang on, is it the same one? Antarctica was the originally named Australia, Terra Australia, sometimes shortened to Australia, as seen as a woodcut illustration titled Sphere of the Winds, contained in an astrological textbook published in Frankfurt in 15. 45, New Holland was named, renamed Australia and Antarctica had to wait 80 years for a new name. I didn't know that. Interesting. Uh, yeah, well, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I mentioned the Piri Reese map, you know, and other medieval maps that seem to show a land down there. I mean, Terra Australis is just southern land. That's what that means. Ah. Um, it's just Latin for southern land. Um, but, yeah, I mean, well, that's a fascinating thing, isn't it, that there are, do seem to be... <laughs> sort of renaissance era or even earlier medieval maps that, 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 that seem to and yeah and even more incredibly they seem to have been copied from even more older maps um i think really? the piri reese map i keep mentioning that one but um which what's it called sorry this one the uh, piri how do you map. i think how it's p-i-r-i -I, piri and then reese mm -hmm. r-e-e-c-e is that right piri reese is how it's spelled no, actually i think that's right. completely wrong actually no, that, that was like piri and then r-e-i-s oh I, i've never heard of it yeah. that's why i'm just looking it up so that's a map from the oh. late medieval period i believe but it's supposed to have been copied from a much much more ancient i think maybe arabian map or something oh. so anyway there is there are suggestions heavy suggestions um that humans were aware that there was a, a continent sized land mass down mm. there um i don't i think i think i'm fairly firm to say that's not really in doubt 
Um, but whether people ever really landed there or certainly tried to trek into the interior of it, <laughs> it doesn't seem to be any, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any evidence of that before the 19th century. Might be wrong. Interesting. Um, just out of, I mean, obviously contemporary story, but there was a film crew, I think, a couple of years ago who claimed that they had evidence of being able to find remnants of civilization there, but they got lost mysteriously. So Antarctica has so many conspiracy theories linked to it, um, by which I mean conspiracy facts, of course. Um, Nazi UFO bases and whatnot. I don't know why that is, but... Okay, so the Puri Reese map. Awesome. Thank you, um, uh, Alan. I appreciate you telling us that. I'll look that woodcut up for sure. So happy Easter. This is the, my friend, the English loyalist. Hello, my friends. Um, happy Easter, everyone. Wonderful to hear the stream. It is GOA. It's always great to hear about the exploration of the Antarctica. Only brave men, only brave men trekked there. That's so very, very true. But thank you so much. That's all. That's all the questions we had. Actually, they're very, very generous and thoughtful. <laughs> Um, what did you have any, thank you everybody and happy Easter everybody. Was there anything else you wanted to finish on? I mean, I feel like I've taken so much time, but I loved talking about that. That was, that was awesome. I'm super pumped now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, as we say, we, as we mentioned, there's, there's so many stories that you, you can't really cover them all. I mean, we've been going a couple of two and a half odd hours mm. and, uh, I feel like there are just loads of small little stories that you could mention, but so you many. can't really do them all. But, um, I, I hope people... Uh, you know, liked it. If um, you know, if they're really interested, they can check out the, uh, both uh, Shackleton's journals and South are on audiobook on like a LibriVox audiobook on YouTube. <laughs> so if anyone actually just wants to get the, all the detail, it's just it's right there. Give it a whirl. I think um, at the moment, if anyone has Kindle, and um, uh, it's free on Kindle as well, or right. when it's not on Unlimited, it's 99p, the South Journey. It's really, I mean, for free, why not? Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's nice. I quite like hearing them read, actually, because you get a bit of the drama and, you know, you, you, the hissing of the, the killer whales and whatnot. I love it. Mm -hmm. uh, have, incidentally, have you ever been, has anyone ever been, I, I, I assume you can take like a, a cruise there? I don't know. Has anyone been to the Antarctic? I've never been there. From what I understand, mm -hmm. it's very difficult you, you you can't you'd have to charter something down there or be on some sort of formal thing yeah. i mean you can go there you can go there there are whole agencies that just deal with sort of extreme holidays <laughs> mm -hmm. so you can go there but it's it's not straightforward <laughs> yeah i was wondering but i i assume they'd managed to cut incidentally is is the scott little, little hut still there Am I right in thinking that one of his little... The Discovery Hut is certainly there. I don't ah. know. If, oh, no, they're both there. And the Terra Nova Hut. I believe they're both oh. still there. Yeah, yeah. All the tins and the cans and whatnot in yeah, there. Yeah, sort of frozen in time almost. Oh. Yeah, because things don't really rot very fast down there. The oh. like, bacteria don't grow, so things just stay almost as they always were for, for a long time. Amazing. Yeah. I should say also, that I, I used to, when I had Twitter... Before I was banned on Twitter, I used to have a follow. A, I think it was called the Heroic Age of Antarctic Exploration by Dan at Dan Nawela. I No, no connection of mine, but his Twitter was always a good follow. It didn't have many followers, but he he did like a couple of lines a day from the, either the Scott or Shackleton journals. Quite worth following. Um, don't know if he's still on Twitter, but and someone in chat said follow or check out Robert Seffer. Don't know who that is, but I'll have a look. Um, yeah, any any final. Thank you. He said, check out Robert Surfer on Atlantis Hyperborea. Oh, cool. Antarctica. I will do that. Yeah, I love that kind of stuff. Um, just checking, see anything else. So, yeah, um, I think I've taken plenty of your time. Is there anything else you wanted to say? No, just thank you for having me on, as always. Really appreciate it. No problem. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I'll end us here and then we can uh, can catch up with you afterwards. But uh, yeah, I hope you've had a lovely Sunday, everyone. It was really enjoyable to um, to chit, chit chat with you all and um, enjoy watching the chat as always. I uh, hope you have a lovely uh, Sunday Easter afternoon. Get some fresh air and eat lots of... Oh, I'd never asked you what chocolate, what Easter egg did the bunny bring you? Me? Mm-hmm. Um, I I didn't get any. I didn't. I didn't, oh, I didn't buy any. <laughs> no. Tomorrow, so. At least tomorrow they'll all be on offer. <laughs> well, that is that is the best thing in Easter. Wait till Easter's over, and then okay. you can get. They like they sell them for like ninety nine p or something. Don't they? <laughs> I mean, you know the drill. Cheap. <laughs> you know the drill. All right, then everyone. I'll say goodbye. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Bye. <laughs>